Well, thanks to all of you who have joined us today. Um, I'm Dr. Kevin Masters, Professor of Psychology at University of Colorado Denver and Director of Clinical Health Psychology at the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center on the Anschutz Medical Campus of the University of Colorado. And we're just getting ready to gear up for our second day of our Sustaining Behavior Change, The Greatest Challenge in Promoting Good Health Conference. And I'm going to wait just a minute. I don't like to punish those who are on time. Um, but we're going to make wait just a minute or so to really begin the conference so we can let the last few people get in. It gets a little bit tricky to uh, connect. So um, if you'll give us just about a minute and then we will get started with our first presentation. Well, like those moments of silence, that wasn't really a true minute, but um, I'll chat for just a little bit while people keep joining. So again, thank you for coming back or coming for the first day, if this is your first day of our conference. I think all of you who were on last week uh, could vouch for the quality of the presentations. They were really fabulous. Um, if, you didn't, if you didn't learn something last week, you're just really super smart, I guess, and we need to have you on our on our panel because there was so much interesting and diverse uh, data that were presented to us. So we're going to try to do it all again this week. And I think we will. We have three amazing speakers uh, on uh, tap for this morning, and then we will be back this afternoon and we will finish up with three more. So let me do just a little bit of housekeeping. The first thing is I want to thank our sponsors that allowed us to be able to do this and put this on for free, which are the the NORCs, the Nutri Nutrition Obesity Research Centers at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and at the University of Colorado, and also the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center here at the University of Colorado. And I also want to thank Christy Truesdale, who has worked behind the scenes and uh, has made this thing really happen. Um, she's really been the one that's, that's put all the pieces in the right place. So thank you, Christy, we appreciate your help with this, and as, as well as our IT professionals at the university because I'm sure that none of us could have done anything with technology. So we are very grateful for their efforts. So for our first session today, we will have doctors Richard Ryan, Martin Hager, and Alex Rothman presenting. And I will provide individual introductions prior to their presentations. Um, I wanna mention that the presentations themselves are pre-recorded, um, but after we have had all three presentations, we will have a live, Q&A time with the three panelists that I will moderate. So throughout the presentations, if you will, uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen and enter your questions for the panelists there. And when we get to the Q&A time, I will be, uh, well, throughout the, throughout the presentations, I'll be attending to those questions, um, kind of getting them ordered. And, uh, and then during the Q&A, I will be presenting those questions uh, to our panelists, and we will have a live discussion, Q&A back and forth, and uh, I think that'll be really an exciting part of the whole thing. I always love to hear what folks have to say with uh, interesting questions coming their way. So that means you have to send us interesting questions. So please do um, as we go through the morning. I'm going to do uh, just some brief uh, bio introduction because um, we you'd rather hear from our panelists than from me, but if you would like more information on the bios for all of our speakers, you can go visit the conference website and you'll find more information there. Uh, the three speakers we have with us in this session are all very well known, so I would suspect that many of you um, won't need to avail yourself of that bio list. Okay, first up uh, this, this morning, uh, well, it's morning here, I guess it's, uh, no, it's not morning everywhere. So uh, first up this day, this Friday, is Dr. Richard Ryan, who is professor at the Institute for Positive Psychology and Education at the Australian Catholic University in North Sydney and professor emeritus at the University of Rochester. Dr. Ryan is of course very well known for as the co-developer of self-determination theory. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with his best-selling book, Self-Determination Theory, 
basic psychological needs and motivation, development, and wellness. Dr. Ryan's among the most cited researchers in psychology and clinical sciences. He's authored over 450 papers and books in the areas of human motivation and well being. And he's been recognized as one of the eminent psychologists of the modern era and listed among the top 20 most influential industrial organizational psychologists. Though I'd like to point out that he is a clinical psychologist, and I know that he was actually a director of a clinical training program at one time. So I want to make sure we clinical psychologists don't get shortchanged there. He's also been honored with three Lifetime Achievement Awards for his work on motivation, personal meaning, self and identity, and has received honorary degrees from the University of Thessaly and honorary membership to the German Psychological Society. Dr. Ryan will be speaking on self-determination theory. Good morning, I'm Richard Ryan, and I'd like to begin by thanking the conference organizers, the University of Colorado, NIH, and particularly Kevin Masters for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm here to talk about self-determination theory, which is a very broad theory of human motivation and wellness. And it's a theory that's been applied in many different domains. We apply it in organizational settings, in educational settings, in psychotherapy settings, in sports settings but it's been a particularly well-researched topic within the healthcare area. And in SDT, we explore things like people's lifestyle choices and how they might influence health, how we can deliver health messages that effectively frame goals so that people will be more likely to undertake them. We focus a lot on practitioner wellness and how we healthcare professionals can stay well even during stressful times, even issues like informed consent and how they can affect people's satisfaction with treatment. But I think the main thing that we've studied in this area within SDT is the topic of this conference. It's really sustained adherence, um, how we can motivate people to maintain change over time. Now, this is a really important problem in the healthcare area, as we know, because, for instance, approximately half of all annual mortality and 70% of all healthcare costs stem from people's behavioral choices. Things like smoking, alcohol use, and obesity are really uh, the focus of so much of our treatment efforts. And we know that people can live longer if they do things like avoid tobacco, if they improve their diet and get better nutrition, if they engage in more physical activity and they avoid excessive alcohol use. Now, even further, they'd be healthier if they would just do what their health professionals tell them to do. So we can ask, why do people do these things? Well, a lot of that comes back to a simple word, the term motivation. Now, everybody in this audience knows what the term motivation means. It means to be moved into action. But when we think about the classical models of how to motivate people that have come from psychology, there are often things that don't work very well for us today in the healthcare sphere. One model comes from operant theory, which is that if we have control over an organism's environment and we can apply to it the right rewards and punishments, we can get it to do most anything. And another classic model is that if we exert authority, if we tell people what they should do and they believe in our expertise that they will do what we say. But these kind of classic ways of motivating people, it's not that they're entirely wrong, but they're pretty limited in their real world utility. For one thing, we, we don't have people trapped in boxes. Uh, they have lots of choices. And if they don't like the reward contingencies or the punishments we put on, they just leave our box. Moreover, they have a lot of concurrent reinforcements operating on them that compete with the ones we might offer. Indeed, when people attempt to control behavior through things like incentives or sanctions, uh, these turn out to be pretty ineffective, especially over time. One of the things we know, for instance, that if you try and uh, change people's behavior by offering them financial incentives, they may change, but only while the financial incentives are in effect. And once those get lifted, so does the motivation lift and people's behavior deteriorates as shown in uh, work, for instance, by Moeller et al, uh, who looked at a, a reward program for decreasing obesity. It's also been uh, evident in recent attempts to get people to be vaccinated. For instance, we see in the news how uh, attempts at uh, offering lotteries or financial incentives to get vaccinated actually slow the rate of vaccination adoption in states where that's been done just again showing the potential backfiring effect of attempting to externally control people's behavior. And this is why in the field of motivation, really for 
the past couple of decades, there's been what we call a Copernican turn in the way that we think about the problems of motivation. We're not focused so much anymore on how we can control people from the outside using rewards and punishments, but rather we're focused on why people choose the things that they do and how can we facilitate their volitional and willing engagement in things that would be good for them. Again, motivation just means to be moved to act, but we can be moved to act by all kinds of things, sometimes really low quality forces like uh, people haranguing us in the environment or again, the carrot and stick uh, approach. But we can also be moved by very high quality motives like really caring about what we're doing or really valuing what's up. And so the, the focus within self-determination theory has been how can we promote these volitional and willing behaviors? And there are really two types of them that we're focused on. One is intrinsic motivation, how we can get people to be interested in what they're doing and find enjoyment in the process of behavior change. And secondly, internalized motivation, how we can help people come to value a, a new behavior that may not be enjoyable, but might be good for them over time so that they can wholeheartedly engage in it. There are multiple ways to support these types of volitional behavior, but there's also a lot of ways to unwittingly undermine and so in SDT, we're really focused on this continuum that goes from lower quality motivation to higher quality motivation. And I just wanna spend a minute going over some of the way stations along that continuum. First is this idea of external regulation, which I've already mentioned here. And this is when people's motivation for behaving is based in externally controlled rewards or punishments. Again, these can be really powerful agents of behavior change. If we have a big enough reward, we can get people to do a lot of things. But the problem is, again, when the reward goes away, so does the behavior. So people can be compliant, but that doesn't necessarily lead to long-term change. And also we see when we try and control people using rewards and punishments, we can evoke a lot of reactance and defiance, which actually undermines our long-term treatment goals. Another form of motivation we look at is called interjection. And this is when you might be motivated because your self-esteem is on the line. You want the approval from others. Uh, to make certain changes, or you want to avoid shame or disapproval. You might, for instance, uh, focus on weight change because you want to get uh, uh, more praise and accolades from others or because you want to avoid the disapproval of your doctor. These motives can be strong, but they tend to be unstable. And when people are uh, low on energy, they tend to particularly fold in these kinds of goals. What we have found is that interjected motivation, again, while it can be activating, doesn't seem to last over time. Still another way we can be motivated is because we identify with the goal that we're pursuing. And that's because we understand its importance or consciously value the activity itself. And so when we have this kind of self-endorsement of goals, this in SDT is expected to lead to more sustainable behavior change over time, as does, uh, intrinsic motivation, when we do something out of interest and enjoyment. This too is a very autonomous form of motivation. And when we can find behavior change areas where we can have some intrinsic motivation, this can contribute to success. So in general, in STT, we're trying to enhance people's quality of motivation for behavior change by moving them away from external and interjected, these controlling forms of regulation, up into more autonomous forms of regulation, like identified, integrated, and intrinsic regulation. We do this because it makes a great deal of difference in the outcomes achieved. And I'm just gonna give a couple simple exa examples of that. This first one comes from a study of physical activity or exercise that was done by Martin Standage and his colleagues in the UK. And what they did is they simply asked people, why do you exercise using our continuum of motivation uh, scales? And then in order to see whether people actually exercised, they gave them an act heart device to wear for a week's time. And uh, they used it to measure uh, moderate uh, bouts of, of uh, exercise that would qualify for AHA uh, guidelines for actually engaging in physical activity. But they found people who endorsed external regulation reasons for exercise, things like, you know, my cook is my doctor told me to, or my spouse pressures me, were that was negatively related to actually exercising over the next week. And interjected regulations were, um, as we would expect, unreliably related to exercise outcomes. They promoted a little exercise, but not significantly so. It was really identified in intrinsic motivations that uh, powered exercise. When you had these kinds of autonomous motivations that reliably predicted whether people truly exercised or not over the next week. 
take another simple example. Let's consider prescription medications. We know, for instance, that uh, most of the time when practitioners prescribe a medication uh, for treatment, people don't take it as prescribed. In fact, less than 50% of the time do people accurately take their medications. So this is a big problem in terms of uh, healthcare costs and healthcare outcomes. Trying to understand medication adherence, uh, Williams et al. Uh, engaged in a study with a, a group of patients who had a chronic illness, uh, the treatment for which was an oral medication that could be taken once or twice a day. These patients rated the autonomy supportiveness or controlling style of the physicians who prescribed the medication. And then also their motivation for taking the medication using the whole continuum of autonomy, which we've just looked at. Now to find out whether people were compliant or adherent or not, uh, the researchers did a couple of things. Two days into the uh, regimen, they called the patient and said, well, we just wanted to double check how many uh, pills that you received in the prescription. The patients counted the pills and that was matched with how uh, many pills should be there if they were accurately following the regimen. They did the same thing again, a pill count at 14 days into the regimen, and they also collected a self-report of adherence. Now, what they found is that more autonomy supportive physicians had people who were more accurate in these pill counts, and those who rated their motivation for taking pills in a more autonomous way were much more reliably likely to be adherent to medication. In fact, what the modeling showed is that when you had an autonomy supportive physician, that led to a more autonomous motives for taking medication. And this in turn accounted for more than 50% of the variance in overall adherence. Just a similar study that was done by uh, Sarah Kennedy on, and her colleagues on uh, medication adherence to antiviral therapies uh, in HIV patients. Uh, what they found is that, uh, again, autonomy support from both family and provider were important predictors of people's autonomous motivation. And that autonomous motivation in turn was associated with greater competence for adhering to medications, and these together led to greater adherence. Also important was that autonomy support from both provider and family was associated with less psychological distress, which in turn uh, was helpful to greater adherence. In fact, uh, what the data showed is that if you look at uh, where the support comes from undergirding adherence, it's most importantly coming from providers. It's provider autonomy support that was the best predictor of patient adherence in this context. I'm going to give one more simple example, and this was an early study that uh, I was able to do with Jeff Williams and other colleagues in a clinic for people with morbid obesity. Here we were looking at the autonomy support versus controlling style of the uh, behavior change counselors that were there, and also patients' motivation for engaging in treatment. And what was found is that when you had a more autonomy supportive uh, behavior change counselor, attendance was better, uh, change in BMI at the end of the program uh, was better, and a maintained change over time was also better. And this was especially predicted by autonomous motivation. Two years out from the program, uh, people were much more likely to have maintained weight loss if they had autonomous motivations for the treatment program. So in general, we find that the more autonomous people are in engaging in behavior change, the more likely they're going to be uh, to sustain the behavior over time. They also show greater commitment to health-related goals and, in general, better health outcomes, as well as greater satisfaction with their providers. And these are effects that hold up across age ranges and across cultures. They seem to be universally important. So the question is for both practitioners and intervention programs, what is it that we can do to facilitate internalization, more autonomous motivation, and therefore the sustained change that comes with them? Well, first and foremost, SDT argues that we need to support autonomy because if people are going to make maintained uh, changes over time, they need to feel ownership over their behavior and come to really value that change. To support autonomy, we begin always by trying to understand the other person's perspective. We could say we empathize with them or take the internal frame of reference of the other. In doing so, we're trying to understand the world from their viewpoint, these goals from their viewpoint, these obstacles from their viewpoint, because it's in understanding where they're coming from that we're going to be able to most help and guide them to make successful change. Wherever we can, we're seeking the patient's input and ideas about change and trying to incorporate them into the treatment program. And we offer as many choices as we can so that the person can find the best fit 
of a way to make changes. Those choices have to be meaningful, not trivial choices, but choices that really make a difference in terms of how they might engage the program. When patients come uh, up against obstacles or they start to show resistances to change, rather than meeting that with criticism or further pressure, we meet it with empathy and care because we want to understand what those resistances are so that we can um, help overcome them. And we try and minimize the use of controlling language or the use of controlling rewards because we, as we've already seen, these can backfire and lead to lower ownership of behavior change. And finally, and this is really important, whenever we're trying to support behavior change, we need to provide a really meaningful rationale so people really understand why they're doing what they're doing. You know, none of us can act autonomously without a good reason for doing so. And a big part of behavior change programs really is about helping people assimilate the good reasons they have for making changes. Now, you can't make behavior change without efficacy either. And a big part of SDT interventions is supporting competence. And we do that by providing really rich feedback that's informational rather than evaluative. So we're trying to help people understand uh, how to make progress during change rather than evaluate them as persons. So we want to design activities so they're mostly uh, feeling uh, a dominant experience of mastery. They know what to do next and they know uh, how to do that next step. And whenever they come across failures or there's a lapse uh, in uh, the behavior change efforts, we treat that failure not, not as a bad thing, but as a, a discovery opportunity a place where we can learn, because now we're gonna find out what obstacles we hadn't quite uh, properly engaged and come up with some new strategies to overcome them. Um, praise is really important as a way of supporting competence, but the praise needs to be about actual effort or about specific accomplishments, not about ability or comparisons with others. It doesn't help to say, oh, you're such a good patient. These kind of praises can actually undermine people's motivation. And finally, and really important and often forgotten in behavior change interventions is people are more motivated when they feel connected to their practitioners, when they feel relatedness. And this comes about because we convey respect for the individual. We help them feel valued and significant in the context of the program by listening to their ideas and also just uh, treating them with care and concern as they face the challenges for behavior change. We found that when we predict people's motivation in any domain, uh, an important predictor is the answer to the following question. My doctor likes me, or my nurse likes me, or my health practitioner likes me. Not I like my nurse, not I like my doctor, but my doctor likes me. That feeling that someone likes you helps you feel connected, and you're much more likely to be uh, compliant and adherent to people uh, who you feel like you rather than if you don't get that experience. And so we say in some ways, this is one of the cheaper ways that we can intervene successfully in health behavior change. So all three of these needs of autonomy, relatedness, and competence are important, but we tend to focus on autonomy support in SDT research because when people are being autonomy supportive, that tends to support all three of these basic needs, in part because autonomy support involves taking the internal frame of reference, you're automatically in a way empathizing with the other person and therefore fostering more connection and relatedness. But also as you empathize with other people and understand their viewpoint on things, you're more aware of the obstacles and issues they might be facing that can help you uh, uh, deal with competence barriers. Now, SDT techniques have been applied in, in many, many studies, and uh, we're beginning to see the emergence of meta-analyses uh, confirming what the overall effects are. One of the first ones that was done was done now 10 years ago by Ng Dumanis and colleagues. And what they did is they meta-analyzed practitioner styles as they related to patient motivation. They found that when practitioners were more autonomy supportive, Patients in healthcare interventions tend to be more intrinsically motivated for change or identified in their motivation for change. Whereas when practitioner, practitioners were more controlling, uh, patients tended to be more externally regulated or amotivated in their motivational styles, which we've seen are less predictive of sustained change over time. In fact, STT techniques have been tried in randomized clinical trials in, in many different areas of uh, physical health care, uh, smoking cessation, uh, physical activity promotion, weight loss and obesity treatment, diabetes management, uh, medication adherence, 
uh, healthy dietary change, uh, even dental hygiene. I've had uh, randomized clinical trials that have shown success of SDT techniques. Um, the, this has been in some ways supported by a recent meta-analysis that was led by Nikos Dumanis, where they looked at uh, SDT-informed uh, intervention studies across the health domain, and they identified 73 such studies. And what their meta-analysis showed is that the application of these SDT techniques indeed produced significant change in patients' uh, need support. Patients felt more competence, more autonomy, and more relatedness in SDT intervention groups. They also um, showed more autonomous motivation for change, and results further showed that SDT theory-informed intervention studies produced uh, better health behaviors at the end of interventions and at follow-up. So this meta-analysis showed some support for the SDT model, as did another recent meta-analysis by Sheeran and colleagues, where they were looking specifically at uh, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that had been done within SDT in the health domain. And here there were 65 such tests that they looked at. And across all of these studies, they found a moderate size effect of SDT interventions in the randomized control settings. Um, and <clears throat> breaking that down, they found significant effects in areas such as sedentary behavior, dietary change, smoking cessation, screen time, uh, dental care, and other areas of importance in, in healthcare. Now, Sharon et al. took this uh, just an extra step by trying to look at some of the active ingredients in self-determination theory interventions. <clears throat> and they found in accord with SDT theory that SDT interventions tended to support more autonomous motivation in patients during the change process, as well as greater perceived competence. And these two mediators uh, helped explain the better health behavior outcomes that were achieved. So just to kind of summarize, what SDT shows is that motivation really matters, but it's quality of motivation rather than amount of motivation that's most in focus. More autonomous forms of motivation like intrinsic motivation and identified motivation are associated with greater persistence and wellness, whereas more external forms of motivation don't show that pattern. Furthermore, in order to create more autonomous uh, motivation for change, SDT argues that we do so by supporting basic psychological needs for a patient's autonomy, competence, and relatedness in the change process. Meta-analyses of both SDT interventions and uh, clinical trials support the efficacy of these SDT techniques. Now, in general, the magnitude of these effects is in the small to moderate range, and that suggests a couple of things. First of all, motivation isn't the only Thing going on in people's adherent outcomes. So there are other variables to look at. But also it suggests that there's room to improve our techniques. So I think that's where we're going in SDT. We're looking at things like whether specific practitioner behaviors uh, are the bigger or lesser influences within our intervention styles. And also we're looking at uh, how practitioners themselves internalize SDT techniques and therefore effectively apply them. There's a lot of areas where we can be improving our interventions, and I'm looking forward to further research in this area, and uh, even more proximally to our panel discussion later in the day where we're going to talk about adherence to, uh, techniques. But I, I think we've seen a lot of progress in SDT over the past couple of decades, and I, I hope we continue that progress. I once again want to thank the organizers of this conference and Kevin Masters for inviting me, and I'll see you all later for our panel discussion. Well, great, uh, Dr. Ryan. That was very, very uh, good. I'd like to point out that we will be, we're recording the talks and they will be available in the next couple of weeks. You, you will receive a, an email that will provide you with more information about the recorded talks. Um, we will also, as a bonus feature, be sure to keep that first few minutes of, of Dr. Ryan's talk in there with two talks going on at once, just to make sure if you weren't able to quite double channel and get both of those at once, you'll be able to do that. So I promise we'll, we'll keep that in there for you, or, or, or maybe not. Uh, I think I've learned a new stress test too from my stress uh, lab research. So, uh, well, you never know. A year and a half or so into Zoom and st there's still surprises. But that was a fabulous kickoff for the morning. Technology snafus aside, <clears throat> 
And now we're going to have another fine talk from Dr. Martin Hager, who's professor of health psychology, Department of Psychological Science at the University of California, Merced, and visiting professor in behavior change at the University of Yavaskula, I believe is how you say it in Finland. Uh, at UC Merced, Dr. Hager is the chair of the graduate programs in psychological sciences and director of the social and health psychology applied behavioral research and prevent for prevention and promotion of the SHARP lab. His research focuses on psychology of health behavior change, and he's currently senior co-editor of social science and medicine. He's previously editor of uh, health psychology reviews. He's on the editorial board of, of about every journal in the field, it seems, very, uh, very willing to serve in that way. He's received numerous awards throughout his career, including being a highly cited researcher and distinguished health psychology contribution award from the International Association of Applied Psychology. And he's a fellow of the European Health Psychology Society, the Society of Experimental Social Psychology, and the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. And Dr. Hager will be speaking on the topic of psychological determinants of behavior change from theory to behavior change. So Dr. Martin Hager. Hello and greetings. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today for the second day of the Sustaining Behavior Change Conference. My name is Martin Hager. I'm a professor of health psychology here at the University of California in Merced, and I'm also professor of behavior change at the University of Uvascular in Finland. I'd like to extend my gratitude to the organizing committee, particularly Kevin Masters and Christy Truesdale for their organization and their kind invitation. I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of the Anxious Health and Wellness Center and the Nutrition and Obesity Centers of Colorado and the University of Alabama. I've entitled my presentation, Psychological Determinants of Behavior Change. Let's begin. Much of my career has focused on identifying the kinds of psychological factors that are reliably related to people's health behavior. What do I mean by health behavior? Well, these are the kinds of behaviors that people might engage or participate in, for example, to minimize their risk of chronic illness or to manage a current illness. For example, these might entail behaviors such as participation in regular physical activity, eating a healthy diet, not smoking, and drinking alcohol only in moderation. But they also might involve behaviors in clinical contexts, such as medication adherence or attending a screening appointment. This slide summarizes some of the kinds of research that we've conducted. I've used a box and arrow diagram. Psychologists are very fond of these box and arrow diagrams in order to illustrate the results of their studies. This particular study was a meta-analysis of studies looking at theory-based psychological constructs that are associated with health-related behaviors broadly defined. Many of the factors, constructs from these theories focus on people's beliefs. In this case, we can see that people's attitudes or their beliefs of, that the behavior will, will result in desirable outcomes, their subjective norms, so their beliefs that significant others will either want them to do the behavior or support them in doing so, and their beliefs about their control over the behavior. That is, their beliefs that they are confident or can perform the behavior in future. And these are related to people's motivation or intentions to perform behavior in future. And these are, this is in turn associated with people's subsequent participation in those health behaviors. What is the value of these kinds of data or findings? Well, they might identify or signal the kinds of factors that might be targeted in behavior change interventions. If we assume that these beliefs can be changed, manipulated, using certain strategies or methods, techniques of behavior change that are used in interventions, then we may have found or identified fact, uh, uh, methods that might reliably be associated or lead to actual behavior change. Now, the kinds of data that I just presented to you are correlational in nature. They don't necessarily tell me that changing people's beliefs, for example, will ultimately lead 
to changes in behavior. However, experimental evidence has suggested that those kinds of associations exist. This slide summarizes a meta-analysis, again with a box and arrow, arrow diagram, of studies looking at methods, strategies, or techniques aimed at changing those factors that I just introduced to you, those psychological variables. The results of the meta-analysis, this is a quantitative summary of the findings of these, this research, demonstrates that people's attitudes, subjective norms, and self-efficacy are changed by these kinds of methods, targeting change in those factors, and ultimately lead to changes in people's intentions or motivation and in their health-related behavior. So this broadens or moves the data further forward, identifying or suggesting that changing these factors actually results in a change in behavior. And that gives us good data on which we might base behavioral interventions in future. Now, the identification of these theory-based determinants of behavior change form the initial step in developing a science of behavior change. This is a relatively new discipline which applies scientific principles to understand, predict, and change people's behavior. It can be summarized in identifying what works in terms of changing behavior and how that works in changing behavior and aims to develop optimally effective interventions or means to change behavior. Like I said, those theory-based determinants form the first step, but there are many other steps that scientists have started to perform in order to try to understand how behavior change interventions work and how we can most optimally use these kinds of methods and strategies to change behavior. And there are a number of steps and leaps forward that scientists have performed recently uh, in contributing to this, uh, this end. For example, identifying the kinds of techniques, strategies, or methods used in changing behavior. What methods have been used in the past? Have they been effective? And so on. This has resulted in classification means. So naming and coming up with a nomenclature for the different strategies or techniques that have been used and classifying them in taxonomies. Identifying the association between those methods or techniques and those theoretical constructs that I introduced to you earlier. In ontologies, networks of associations between these methods, the psychological factors they are presumed to change and actual change in behavior. And then specifying exactly how those techniques or methods change those factors, activate those psychological factors, and lead to actual behavior change. And importantly, developing a basis or large body of evidence that demonstrates their efficacy in changing behavior is an important step. And therefore, producing a comprehensive evidence base for their e efficacy, which can then be tapped into by people who are interested in changing behavior and developing behavior interventions. And then finally, of course, including those techniques and strategies that have been found to be efficacious in large-scale effectiveness trials in real-world field contexts. I will now outline some of those advances or steps and how they've contributed to developing optimally effective behavior change interventions. A key advance in the science of behavior change, as I intimated earlier, is the identification, classification, and naming of behavior change techniques. What are behavior change techniques? Well, they are the content of behavior change interventions. They are the methods and strategies that do the work when it comes to changing the behavior often called the active ingredients of behavior change interventions. Now, classifications of behavior change techniques have attempted to identify the unique building blocks of those interventions, the irreducible and unique behavior change techniques. These can be seen as the tools in a behavior changes toolbox, and they can be used independently or in conjunction with others in behavior change interventions. 
Now, these kinds of techniques we would expect to be associated with those kinds of factors that I identified earlier that are known as the determinants of behavior change interventions. So let's look at some work that has attempted to look at the links between techniques and those constructs. Now, developing an evidence base linking behavior change techniques from these classifications or taxonomies with the theory-based psychological constructs that are reliably associated with behavior, such as those as I presented earlier, is an important advance in the science of behavior change. Now, developing these classifications or taxonomies of behavior change technique, techniques and coming up with a common language or vernacular to describe them is an important first step. But these taxonomies will have greater utility if the techniques that they identify and classify are linked with theory-based psychological determinants of behavior. So how do we identify techniques that reliably change these determinants and behavior? Numerous means have been purported to do so. One is just by knowledge of the theory, which demonstrate or theoretically identify the kinds of methods that might be used to change determinants and in turn change behavior. The other is through evidence reviews, looking at research that has looked at both changing methods that change behavior, but also concomitantly change the, 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 the determinants of behavior. The third method is through expert consensus. That is capitalizing on the knowledge of experts to identify these links. Now, this research has led to the development of so-called heap maps, which represent the strength of the evidence linking techniques with these constructs in, from different theories. And those heat maps provide us with an idea of where the current evidence lies in terms of the techniques that might be used to effectively change behavior and how they might be changing behavior by changing these theoretical constructs. And also where there is a dearth of evidence, limited evidence, linking techniques and uh, these constructs and in turn changing behavior. In addition to that, it may also indicate which techniques are not effective in changing specific constructs and therefore changing behavior. Now, currently, those heat maps suggest that there is evidence for these links, but it's relatively limited. And particularly in intervention and experimental tests of these processes or mechanisms that may underpin behavior change as represented by the links between techniques, constructs from theory, and behavior. But this has led to a better understanding of the associations between these links and enables researchers to map out which techniques are, uh, which techniques are associated with both behavior and the theoretical constructs they're purported to change to provide a better picture and understanding of how these associations work. I've called this the mapping of the genome of behavior change interventions. Here's an illustration of that heat map of links between behavior change techniques and the psychological determinants they are purported to change. You can see in the grid that the blue squares illustrate support through evidence for those links. Uh, the blue squares represent non-links and the white squares represent no evidence with yellow representing inconclusive evidence. So you can see at a glance whether a particular technique is effective in changing a particular determinant and give you, it gives a researcher an idea of how interventions might work purportedly using these kinds of techniques and strategies in interventions. In this slide, I present a further illustration of the associations or links between these behavior change techniques and these theoretical determinants which are purported to be activated in order to change behavior. At the apex, we have intervention content, and below that, we have a list of different behavior change strategies or techniques illustrated by the boxes and the associated targeted determinants. For example, if we wanted to change people's beliefs, their attitudes towards a behavior, for example, their perceptions that performing the behavior will result in some desirable outcome, then we might provide them with general information about the positive outcomes or describe the consequences of performing the behavior. If we wanted to highlight the risk 
of doing or not doing a particular behavior. We might emphasize a person's susceptibility of some illness or consequence of doing or not doing that behavior. If we wanted to promote people's uh, support, social support from significant others, we might highlight that others may approve of changing their behavior. And we would do this through persuasive communications. If we wanted to change people's confidence or self-efficacy, we might prompt successful experience or mental rehearsal, uh, set, help them to set graded goals, all of which might feed in to their sources of self-efficacy or confidence. So this just illustrates some of the kinds of techniques that might be associated with these theoretical constructs that we have illustrated are associated with behavior. Now, research developing an evidence base for associations or links between behavior change techniques and the psychological determinants of behavior is an important first step in understanding how behavior change interventions work. And this is fed into recent work that has focused on the mechanisms of action of behavior change interventions. Mechanisms of action illustrate how behavior change interventions work. And the linking and the matching of behavior change techniques with constructs from theories is an important first step in this regard. The value of identifying these mechanisms means that we can identify how these interventions work, when they might work, and in which contexts and populations and for which behaviors. It also illustrates or provides us with guidance on which techniques might not work in changing people's psychology, their psychological determinants, and changing behavior. And this will lead to more effective behavior change interventions, but also more efficient behavior change interventions in enabling us to eliminate the kinds of techniques which might work and which might not work and include the techniques which might work in changing behavior. Now, people studying mechanisms of behavior change assume a basic process model, which theoretically links these behavior change techniques with behavior through change in those mechanisms. And this can be tested through inter intervention and intervention research and experimental research that provides evidence that including these kinds of techniques from the taxonomies changes these determinants or psychological factors and changes behavior. But there is a need for further evidence because these kinds of mechanisms are not routinely tested in the current evidence. In this diagram, I illustrate that basic process model of a behavior change intervention that I intimated earlier. In the far left, we have a box that represents a behavior change method or technique. And these are the kinds of strategies we've been discussing from those taxonomies of behavior change techniques earlier. And these might be presented, for example, as a persuasive communication or a message, or as a prompt for an individual or a group to engage in a certain exercise or strategy that may result in behavior change. And these techniques are associated purported to be associated with these psychological modifiable factors through theory. And those factors are purported to result or be linked to behavior change. And we would need to verify through evidence demonstrating that introducing this technique or strategy through those means of delivery I outlined earlier, for example, would lead to a change in those modifiable factors and the change in those modifiable factors would coincide with subsequent change in behavior, demonstrating how the intervention is working by changing people's psychological constructs. And this pathway here illustrates the direct effect or the efficacy of the intervention itself. And taken together, the process represents the mechanism of action. And we would need to present evidence supporting this mechanism in order to fully confirm or understand the mechanism by which the intervention is working in order to change behavior. This science of behavior change work, particularly the identification of behavior change techniques, the determinants of behavior change and the mechanisms involved, provide formative evidence on which behavior change interventions can be based. Specifically, it provides guidance on the selection of appropriate techniques to change behavior 
in the given population whose behavior needs to change, the behavior that is of interest that needs to change, and the context in which it should be changed. So research on those determinants and mechanisms helps guide the selection of appropriate content of behavior change interventions. One key aspect is the extent to which the population of interest is ready to change their level of intention or motivation to perform the target behavior, the behavior of interest. And there are some key questions that might help guide the selection of appropriate intervention techniques and the content of those interventions, such as, is the population of interest motivated to change? How strong is that motivation? Is there a habitual component that needs to change? And are there available social resources that can be tapped into in order to facilitate change? Let's have a, take a closer look at these aspects. Quite a few of the theories that have been typically applied to predict and understand health behavior change focus on motivation. This is unsurprising because motivation is a strong correlate of behavior and those who have low motivation or intentions to perform a behavior are unlikely to do so in the future. So in populations with low motivation to perform the behavior of interest, a behavior change intervention would need to have content, use techniques that target change in motivation. Now, many of the theories that have been applied to behavior change focus on beliefs, particularly beliefs about outcomes, personal resources, and social norms as the key determinants that need to change, and therefore techniques, particularly messages that change beliefs and activate them, uh, would be most effective in initiating motivation and change in behavior. So potential strategies that target change in these determinants of motivation and therefore the determinants of behavior include persuasive communications and threatening messages, modeling, prompting practice, promoting goal setting, and recruiting social support. Let's look at some illustrations. For example, to change people's beliefs or their attitudes, we might present information, a persuasive communication or message within a pamphlet or a leaflet. These physical activity leaflets highlight the benefits or the positive outcomes of performing physical activity on a regular basis. In a similar vein, these kinds of persuasive communications may seek to activate people's risk perceptions, such as this poster, which makes the link between consuming a soft drink and potential risk of a chronic disease. Such communications may also seek to change behavior by activating an emotional response, such as these threatening messages that aim to elevate levels of fear. And that level of fear motivates people to change their behavior in order to reduce the level of fear. These kinds of messages are most appropriate when they're also, a or most effective, when they're also accompanied by information about efficacy. How can a person change? Messages can also seek to promote greater confidence and self-efficacy in performing the behavior in future by modeling, such as these persuasive communications and social media messages, which aim to model, using the target population, the desired behavior, that is women performing physical activity. Although strategies to promote greater motivation or intention is often effective in changing behavior, especially amongst those with low motivation or intentions, sometimes motivation is not enough. This is often illustrated by research demonstrating the link between intentions and behavior, as you can see here. The link between intentions and behavior is often imperfect. And this means that maybe some people are converting their good intentions to perform a behavior, but others are not. And so this association is imperfect. So strategies that might help in this regard would be those that aim to strengthen the intention behavior relationship. In other words, they aim to fill the intention behavior gap. Now dual phase theories have focused on this intention enactment 
and focused on planning and certain types of self-efficacy, targeting change in certain types of self-efficacy have been shown to help people enact their intentions and deal with setbacks. And this involves potential strategies and techniques, such as prompting action plans, coping plans, and prompting plans to, to restart the behavior after lapses or setbacks. Let's take a look. For example, here's an intervention that uses a planning worksheet to prompt individuals to engage in a planning exercise or activity where they map out or plan their activity in future. It prompts them to identify the behavior of interest, when they will perform it, and where they will perform it in the future. These kinds of planning interventions have been shown to be very effective, particularly amongst those who are motivated to change, but haven't exactly thought through the kinds of steps that they need to take in order to do so. But what about behaviors that are highly rewarding and impulsive, such as eating palatable foods, consuming alcohol, or smoking and vaping? These behaviors become bad habits because of the rewarding properties of the behaviors themselves and because they are cued up by cues or triggers in the person's environment. In these cases, motivation, again, may not be sufficient to get a person to change. The strong habitual component of the behavior often bypasses people's good intentions, and particularly when people have low restraint or control over their behavior, the capacity or ability to resist impulses. In this case, the context or the environment may work against a person's motivation, so even if they desire or are motivated to change, they may not do so because of the cues and the triggers that are omnipresent in their context or environment. In these cases, it would be important to try and interrupt that cue response cycle, the association between the context and the person's behavior. And there are a number of behavior change techniques or strategies that might enable a person to do this, such as restructuring their context or environment, planning to interrupt the behavior when the cue does arise, changing a person's micro environment and moving them in the right direction through things like choice architecture or so-called nudging. Let's take a look. Take, for example, a person who's trying to eat more healthily. In order to avoid highly rewarding, high sugar and high fat foods, they might adopt a change technique or a strategy of restricting the availability of those foods. So they might not purchase those foods or have them available in their house or at meal times. Here's another strategy to change people's behavior by changing their environment. This is using a choice architecture or nudge a so-called default nudge. In this case, standing desks were set at the default standing position to promote greater standing at work, which is better for health in terms of posture, as well as promoting physical activity. And sure enough, when people's desks were set at default standing position, people were more likely to engage in standing time, more standing time than when they were set at the default sitting position. So that concludes my whistle-stop tour of the current status of the science of behavior change. I focused on advances that have been made in the science of behavior change, including identifying determinants, modifiable determinants from psychological theory that are reliably associated with behavior, and how we can leverage those determinants using techniques that form the content of behavior change interventions to change behavior and the mechanisms involved in order to come up with optimally effective behavior change interventions. As a coda to this presentation, I will outline some of the things that we need to do in order to advance the science of behavior change. We need more comprehensive data that fills the gaps in that heat map linking psychological constructs and the techniques that are purported to change them. We need more systematic techniques and tests of those mechanisms of action particularly because that data will provide us with the opportunity to synthesize data on behavior change interventions and their mechanisms. And we need more factorial designs 
that tests individual or groups of techniques against each other, which may, may make for more efficient, tighter interventions to change behavior. You can learn more about the science of behavior change in this recently published handbook. The book comprises multiple chapters authored by leading experts from different disciplines on the theory and practice of behavior change. Thank you for listening and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, wow, those were two, two really amazing presentations. And I don't know if you noticed, as I did, that our next speaker, Dr. Alex Rothman, was actually mentioned by way of a, being a contributing author to, uh, ref, to uh, reference works that were cited in both of our previous talks. So this will be a great way to, to wind up our morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. So now we are going to take a break. We're gonna take about 10 minutes so let's reconvene at what in mountain time, or God's country as we call it, will be 1115. If you're not in God's country for you, but you're in the central time zone, it'll be 1215 on the east, 115. And those of you out west, obviously, 1015. So we will see you in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. All right, I think we're back in the saddle uh, for our, um, our last presenter this morning. And then we will, um, we will have our Q&A, which I'm excited about. We have a lot of really good questions, and I'm going to have a tough time getting them all organized and ready to go. So but we're going to be hard on our presenters. We're going to make them earn it today with these good questions we have for them. So next up uh, is Dr. Alex Rothman, who is professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Rothman works across a broad array of health domains, and with, with his colleagues, he's contributed to our understanding of a range of issues, including why and when different health communication strategies are most effective, the decision processes that underlie the initiation and maintenance of behavior change, and the development of strategies for optimizing the integration of theory and practice. Dr. Rothman um, is really one of the first folks that I ever read many years ago who talked about this idea that how we initiate behavior change and the effective techniques those might not be the same thing as how we sustain it, which seemed like a really uh, appropriate insight. Hopefully he'll talk a little more about that today. Dr. Rothman served as president of the Society for Health Psychology and was the founding president of the Social Personality and Health Network. He's contributed to a range of NIH initiatives, including co-developing the NCI NIH sponsored Advanced Training Institute on Health Behavior Theory, and he co-led the NHLBI NIH accumulating data to optimally predict obesity treatment, or maybe better known as the ADOPT core measures project. And currently he co-chairs the NCI Cognitive, Affective and Social Processes in Health Workgroup. The title of Dr. Rothman's presentation is Mapping and Leveraging the Determinants of Sustained Behavior Change, Three Key Challenges. So now we will have Dr. Rothman's presentation. Hi. I'm Alex Rothman. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Minnesota, and I'm delighted to uh, be able to join you today as part of this virtual conference. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and um, thank you for uh, for spending this time listening to my presentation. And I look forward to uh, talking with everybody during the question and answer session. So, um, OK, well, let's uh, let's go to my let's go to my presentation. Okay. Um, so the title of my talk is Mapping and Leveraging the Determinants of Sustained Behavior Change, Three Key Challenges. Now, uh, before I, uh, I get into the specific uh, issues I'd like to talk with you today, I just sort of step back and note that uh, really this is a time of tremendous opportunity for those of us interested in strategies that can help people make and sustain changes in their behavior. I think the evidence is pretty clear that behavioral practices have important implications for health, and um, we've seen this in a variety of ways. Uh, you can see that on the right, the figure illustrates the contribution of behavior to premature death. And on the left, 
is some uh, in some data that looks at sort of what is the impact of people who engage in sort of zero one to five uh, low risk lifestyle behaviors. And so we, we sort of have clear evidence that sort of engaging in certain patterns of behavior has a positive effect on the sort of quality and quantity of people's lives. But the challenge for us is, well, how do we help people initiate and maintain changes in those behaviors? And, um, and that's really, I, I, I think, the focus in many ways of this virtual conference. So in my contribution, and in the time I have today, I'd like to touch on a set of issues that I believe need to be addressed if we're gonna maximize our progress in promoting sustained behavior change. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we think about the constructs, in particular, the constructs that drive sustained behavior change. And uh, I'm gonna sort of talk with you about some importance of making distinctions in how we think about those constructs between three different classes and the importance of developing intervention strategies to modify those different types of targets. And I'll talk to you about more about that in a moment. Second, um, I think we need to be much more clear about what the outcomes are we're trying to achieve. Sort of what is sustained behavior change? What is success at maintenance and what is failure at maintenance? And then third, I'd like to emphasize what I think is the value of both anticipating and pursuing heterogeneity in our effects. And, uh, and that there may be real importance to delineating the conditions under which the interventions, which intervention strategies that we use operate and dealing with that at the outset of our work. And I'll touch on that third. Okay. So now before I get started, I just want to sort of set, set, the, set a framework here that I'm going to be using for talking about sustained behavior change. And this really is grounded in what's really emerged over the last 10 to 15 years, which is this set of tools and frameworks designed to support the testing of behavior change interventions. And um, you may be familiar with some of these or all of these already, but let me just quickly sort of note, here are some different frameworks that have emerged over this period of time. In the upper left, you'll see the Science of Behavior Change uh, Initiative from NIH. On the right is the, the orbit model developed by Susan Joukowsky and her colleagues. In the bottom right is Linda Collins's multi-phase optimization strategy or most. And in the bottom left is the theory and techniques tool uh, led by uh, Susan Mickey and her colleagues. And although there are some differences between these different frameworks, they all are grounded on what I would call a mechanistic approach to behavior change. That is, they all emphasize that intervention development and testing depends critically on mapping and testing the mechanism or mechanisms that are theorized to underlie an intervention's effectiveness. And I sort of would suggest that this broader sort of underlying framework could be, has, could be described as uh, the, with the term the Amer experimental medicine approach, a term that uh, the Science of Behavior Change group uses and that uh, my colleagues Pascal Sharon and Bill Klein and I have used. And, um, and this, what, a key facet of, the, of this approach is the recognition that intervention effects are a function of two change processes. What's called the, what we call the validity path and the engagement path. So the validity path, which is on the right of the screen, represents a target or mechanism of action's ability to elicit a change in behavior. Okay. And then the engagement path on the left represents the intervention or intervention techniques ability to elicit a change in that putative target. Thus, an intervention's effectiveness is predicated on its ability to engage a valid target. If we identify a poor or invalid target, or we rely on a strategy that fails to engage a target, will result in an ineffective intervention. Although discussions of the experimental medicine approach, and particularly in the, in the rest of my presentation, are going to rely on the simplified models with a single target or single intervention, I want to just note that it can be applied to situations that are more complex. And so with more than one target as well as more than one intervention strategy. So up on the left, you might see here, just to illustrate, to have this in the back of your mind, an intervention might be designed to engage with two targets that are critical. And or, or an intervention may be comprised of different components, each of which is designed to engage with a particular target. More than anything, I just want to have this complexity in the back of your mind as you, as you hear the rest of my presentation. And I'm happy to talk more about its implications during the question and answer portion. So when you're working with an within this mechanistic approach to behavior change, the real question is, is sort of which constructs have been shown to be valid targets? And um, now our theories are replete with potential constructs that we could go after, but so the critical question is, which of those have been shown to be valid? What I'd like to sort of emphasize today is that this, um, this question becomes even more complex uh, in the current 
context and when we're in interested in using a mechanistic approach to understand sustained behavior change. Because now the question is, which constructs have been shown to be valid targets for the initiation and or maintenance of behavior change? So um, just get myself organized here. So the first class of targets is really, um, actually, sorry, get to the next slide here. So I'm going to suggest that what we need to do is we need to distinguish between sort of three classes of targets. And on this slide, I show you what I think is the first class of targets, which is I've, I've termed initiation targets. These are constructs that when engaged, elicit initial changes in behavior. Now, recognizing that the specific targets may potentially vary across behavioral domains, eating, activity, sleep, smoking, to name but a few, Reviews of the literature have suggested a number of potential candidates, and these are things I, I guess as many of you are, are familiar with. So outcome expectations, intentions, goals that people set, their self-efficacy for engaging in a particular, particular task. The key thesis here is that these targets primarily impact, have their impact through their ability to support the initiation of behavior change. That's why we would engage them. And to the extent that they impact, effect, maintain change, it's through their effect on that initial behavior change, sort of documented in the, in the boxes and arrows on your screen. Now, a second class of targets is what I would call initiation and maintenance targets. These are constructs that when engaged are hypothesized to elicit initial changes in behavior. So that's similar to the initiation targets, but they also separately can support uh, maintain changes in behavior. Okay, so these are targets that when engaged actually have make have contributions to both outcomes. And here, reviews of the literature have at least identified potential targets as well. Um, so it might be sort of people's ability to engage in self monitoring and and under develop and respond to feedback on their behavior. It could be their ability to enjoy the behavior, um, uh, or perhaps the access or availability of material resources. Here again, the key thesis is that engaging in these targets serves to support people as they initiate changes in their behavior and as they strive to maintain those changes. Although the magnitude of their contribution to those two outcomes might vary. So there might be some of these targets, although they contribute to both outcomes, some of them may have slightly more of an effect on maintenance. Some of them might have slightly more of an effect on initiation. The third target and what is sort of depicted in the screen in, with the orange is uh, the class of targets comprised of what I call maintenance targets. These are constructs that when engaged are hypothesized to underlie or support maintain changes in behavior. Now they could be attributes, thoughts, feelings, or skills that emerge from engaging in those behaviors, or they could be attributes that are uniquely applicable to the tasks associated with uh, maintenance. Here, reviews of the literature have identified a number of potential candidates, albeit a smaller set. However, these are, I think, actually uh, constructs that we've heard discussed uh, in a number of the presentations during this conference. So autonomous motivation, routines or habits, identity, and perhaps people's satisfaction with the outcomes afforded by their behavior. Again, the key thesis here is that the engaging these targets serves to support people as they strive to maintain changes in their behavior. Now, I've suggested, and in, there's been some suggestion in the literature of the idea of sorting these targets into these three different buckets. The challenge before us, though, is to develop the evidence base to actually support these classifications. So we know quite a bit about the idea that targets might support initiation, but we don't really know much about sort of the degree to which targets differentially contribute to these different outcomes. Moreover, we know even within these buckets, we also don't know about which of these targets are actually the most promising targets to support the different outcomes that we're interested in. And so there's really quite a bit of work to do. And I would suggest that sort of at least using this framework of thinking about these targets as um, within these different classes is an important and useful next step to advancing our work in this area. However, oops, sorry. However, identifying potential classes of valid targets is necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? So we need to identify and develop intervention techniques that effectively and hopefully efficiently can engage with these targets, right? So we need, we may be able to identify valid targets, but now we need to actually engage with those targets. At present, our behavior change toolbox is really actually, at, at, from one vantage point, quite full. Susan Mickey and her colleagues have identified 93 distinct behavior change techniques that are in this toolbox. However, it's important to remember that we need intervention techniques that engage targets across all three of these classes. And perhaps not surprisingly, the techniques that have been developed 
are been primarily focused on engaging with initiation targets. And sometimes this is, we've been in focused on those targets and primarily I would like to suggest we've really focused on developing strategies that engage with those targets. Let me just give you a quick illustration of this state of affairs. And these are data from a review led by my colleague, Pascal Sheeran. And this was a focused on a, a review of intervention trials to promote physical activity with people who have survived cancer. And in particular, these were trials that had at least two measures of physical activity after the intervention so that they could look at sort of initiation and maintenance of activity. What I want to do today is just sort of focus you on just a small slice of the data. And this is just a window into what were the techniques actually used in these trials. And, um, uh, um, and uh, Pascal and his colleagues sort of were able to sort of identify sort of three different sets of uh, potential techniques that map onto the three sets of targets I just talked about, right? So you have at the top of this graph techniques for initiation. In the middle is techniques for initiation and maintenance. And at the bottom are techniques um, for maintenance. And what this bar graph represents is what the, 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 what the, what it shows is sort of the more, uh, the more, the further the black line goes to the right, it shows the greater percentage of trials that actually included the particular technique. And what I hope you can sort of quickly see is not only that there were across these trials, many more techniques for initiation used than the other two, but they were also just used much more frequently, right? So the greater preponderance of trials included techniques for initiation. And maybe what I'll just sort of emphasize very briefly is to suggest, is to point out that um, of the eight techniques for maintenance that were potentially could potentially be used that we, in this domain, um, only two of them were used in more than 10% of the trials. Um, three of them were hardly used, and uh, three of them were never used. And so, um, so it's sort of a nice illustration of the fact that although we might be interested in, in maintenance, we're really much more less likely to actually in our interventions include techniques for maintenance. Another way of looking at this is this is just sort of the mean number of techniques included per trial. And what you can see in green is on average, a trial had about six different techniques designed to promote initiation. Um, maybe two techniques and that were in that initiation and maintenance class and uh, less than one technique that we would have put in that maintenance class. Um, why this is important is that um, we can't really test the impact of our targets if we don't have or don't use intervention techniques that engage them. So critically, our ability to sort of sort of test that experimental lesson approach requires having both valid targets and having techniques that actually can effectively engage those targets. Let me move now to on to my second question. I'd like to, to talk briefly about. So we can have valid targets and we can have uh, techniques that engage those targets, but what's really important in this setting is making sure that we have a clear understanding about what the outcomes are, right? So a critical part of this is, well, what is sustained behavior change? And in particular, how do we operationalize maintenance, success, and failure? Of course, the specific definitions that, you know, behavioral definitions will be tied to the behavioral domain. So how we identify uh, intervention, you know, uh, maintenance, success, and maintenance failure will obviously be couched within a, a particular uh, behavioral domain. But I think it's interesting to at least think about whether there are a, a core set of parameters that can be used to operationalize those, those outcomes. And two, recognizing that across behavioral domains, you'll see that there's really actually quite a difference in to the extent to which there is consensus about what marks, what defines uh, uh, maintenance success and maintenance failure. And I wanna just sort of use two examples, smoking cessation and physical activity to illustrate this point. So smoking cessation is an area where there's actually a considered effort to have a consensus definition of maintenance, which in this case is abstinence. And that's been sort of articulated in the literature. And I've, I've given you a graph from a, a recent statement of that consensus by Megan Piper and colleagues. What you can see in this is what they've done is they've identified what is the sort of threshold? What's the, what indicates successful initiation? And that was a 24 hour quit. And then they have a couple of different ways of operationalizing um, abstinence, which is be the maintenance of behavior change. So in this case, it could be continuous abstinence, which is not smoking, not even a puff since that quit day, prolonged abstinence, which is not smoking or even a puff after a sort of a grace period that followed that initial 24 hour quit, or what is called in, their, in, the, in the smoking area, repeated point prevalence abstinence, which is just as we're looking at sort of particular windows of time. And every time we look, we keep getting reports that you haven't smoked at all. The other thing that these that in this area researchers have done is they've had consensus about sort of what is considered a lapse, so a slip from maintenance, and in particular, what is considered relapse or maintenance failure. In this case, it would be returning to smoking after abstinence for seven consecutive days. 
And so this sort of thinking about this sort of deviation from maintenance, I think is, is critically important. However, I, I would like to suggest that in other behavioral domains, for example, in eating and physical activity, there's much less consensus about um, how to operationalize these variables. Moreover, I think it may even be unclear whether the framework, this sort of lapse relapse framework that's used within domains like smoking cessation even sort of works in the, on these other domains. And um, just to sort of illustrate these points, I just want to sort of highlight the need for a, to develop a definition of maintained physical activity. And here I'm, I'm going to sort of talk briefly about a, a paper that's been led by my colleague Genevieve Dunton, where really the argument has been made that, that we have to develop a consensus definition of maintained physical activity in order to make sure, in order to advance progress in research on strategies to promote maintained physical activity. However, when you start to think about how to develop this definition, it's, I think it clearly comes clear maybe a why there isn't consensus or at least that developing consensus is gonna be a challenge. And I just wanna highlight a couple of issues. Um, first, one of the questions that quickly emerges is, well, what's the threshold that defines the level of activity that needs to be maintained? So what's the analog in physical activity for that 24 hour initial quit? And should that level be universal? Um, like 150 minutes of modern vigorous physical activity per week, or should it be personalized to an individual? Second, how long does someone need to achieve that threshold to be considered to engage in maintenance, right? So in uh, smoking cessation, you had to be quit for 24 hours and then maintenance begins. Can you maintain that 24 hour quit? So what does that look like in physical activity? Could we do the similar thing? The second that somebody hits whatever the target is, are we looking to see, can they maintain engagement with that target? Or is there a duration that needs to be captured there first before we describe it as maintenance? Third, and in my mind, probably the most vexing or challenging aspect is, um, how do we understand degrees of deviation from that set threshold of physical activity? So sort of what's a physical activity slip or lapse? Or what's a physical activity relapse? And here, I think what becomes particularly challenging is that in, um, in smoking, a slip or a lapse is actually engaging in a particular behavior. Whereas in uh, physical activity, it's the absence of the behavior, right? It's engaging in less physical activity. And so how is that experienced by people? And how do we even think about those deviations, right? So for example, is a drop in activity that might be takes you from, you know, 200 minutes, 250 minutes of modern vigorous physical activity a week to 160 modern vigorous physical activity per week. Uh, does, does that drop in minutes a slip, even if the overall level of activity is still above what is might be the set threshold? of 150. Um, uh, similarly, sort of what's the duration of that deviation that really matters, right? So what's the sort of physical activity equivalent of smoking for seven consecutive days, which was marked as a relapse, right? So how long do you need to be engaged in that sort of deviation of activity in order to be deemed a physical activity, a failure at phys physical activity maintenance? These are really complicated issues and um, really more, more the, the, the Dunton paper is really a more call for the need for consensus. And really what I wanna leave you here more than anything is that, that we've gotta develop consensus definitions of behavioral maintenance in the domains that we work. If we really wanna successfully sort of develop an evidence base that will help us understand sort of what are the strategies that are gonna help people succeed or fail at uh, uh, long-term sustained behavior change, right? So we, if we got to understand sort of what is success and failure in each of these domains, if we're going to generate an appropriate evidence base. Okay. So now let me just take you finally to my, my third area that I want to just briefly talk to you about. And here, what I'd like to sort of note is that um, as we work on understanding sort of the determinants of sustained behavior change, we need to be prepared to uh, embrace the heterogeneity of our effects. And so um, we're particularly interve usually interested in interventions that um, can promote initial changes in behavior and maintain changes in behavior. However, it's become increasingly apparent that our interventions, even those that are shown to be effective, are often marked by substantial heterogeneity in response. And the challenge really is, you know, and this sort of is challenging. We thought that if we could figure out a valid target and we could get a, a, a strategy that can engage that target, we thought we were set, right? We would have an effective intervention. And really what we're grappling with now is, well, it works on average, but underneath that average is surprising amounts of heterogeneity. Um, sort of this validity, this variability in response to treatment can be found in a myriad of domains. I've just highlighted one here. This is from the ADOPT project that I had the uh, pleasure of co-leading with my colleague Paul with Paul McLean. Um, and really what, more than anything, what I want just to note is that this is an area, and this is adult obesity treatment, that even those treatments that have been shown to be effective, 
are characterized by exceptional variability in response. And, and that's what these graphs up here just reveal, which is so that even those things that on average work really underlying it, there's a remarkable amount of variability. Now, this is something that is not just true of adult obesity treatment. And um, Pascal Sharon and I sort of reviewed meta-analyses of interventions designed to change health behaviors that were published in, in three leading journals over a 10-year period. We identified 46 of those um, interventions, uh, meta-analyses. And what did we find was that um, they all sort of reported, sort of, they all reported effect sizes. So they reported whether they found sort of an overall effectiveness of the intervention. But really what we wanted to sort of focus in on is um, what was the heterogeneity of the effects that they were they observed. And what they found is that 38 out of the 46 reported significant heterogeneity in their effects. And this is a, a graph of the sort of the magnitude of that heterogeneity captured by the sort of I squared value that reflects the variance in true effect size. And uh, what you can see is the median effects, uh, the median I squared was really quite substantial, about 60, uh, 61%. What's really critical, though, is that across all of these 46 um, approaches, the intervention, uh, the, the um, heterogeneity really was substantial and common, but remained unexplained, right? And so um, almost none of the intervention, none of these meta-analyses were able to actually explain uh, any of the variants uh, captured in, this, in the I-squared measure. And what Pascal and I have suggested is that the, the problem is, is that most of our work in terms of heterogeneity has been reactive. We're trying to ask ourselves after the fact, you know, what led us to have variability in the uh, outcomes that we're interested in. And to address this, what we have developed is something that we call the operating conditions framework, which really sort of asks us to sort of think about the links between mechanisms for our interventions and the conditions under which those mechanisms operate. And so what the idea here is that is that when we're thinking about targets of our interventions, we really need to also be thinking about the conditions under which these change processes operate. And so that as we're thinking about what are valid targets, we also need to be thinking about what are possible moderators of that, of that validity. And similarly, as we start to think about strategies that are potentially effective ways of engaging those targets, we need to be thinking about moderators that actually engage um, what we call engagement moderators that affect those paths. So very, very sort of briefly, what I want to just note is that the idea here is that, is that, what, that what this suggests is that discussions about that validity path that was really focused on whether the mechanism, the target was valid, really now should be a conversation simultaneously about what are valid targets and what are the conditions under which the target is valid. And the idea is to sort of help us think a priori what is the what are effective strategies and what are the conditions? Well, what are effective targets and what are the conditions under which those targets may or may not be uh, related to the outcome? Similarly, we can think about this at the engagement path, and so this is the same sort of approach. Which is the idea is that we may want to identify intervention strategies that have potential to elicit changes in those targets, but in doing that, we want to be thinking a priori about the conditions necessary for that intervention target to operate what we again have been calling engagement moderators. Now, um, the challenge is, is that we really know very, very, very little about sort of engagement moderators or validity moderators, right? So um, Pascal Sheeran and I sort of uh, went back to those 46 meta-analyses that we had looked at. These were meta-analyses of, of behavior change interventions, and none of them reported any evidence for any uh, validity moderators or engagement moderators. We've now looked sort of broader in the literature, and that's what this table illustrates. And more than anything, what I want you just you to take away at this moment is that what we know about in engagement moderation and validity moderation is, is at best idiosyncratic. Um, it just happens to be sort of effects that have emerged. Now, this is thinking about this just very generally. This is critically going to be an issue when we start to think about the sort of operation of uh, targets for initiation and targets for maintenance, right? So this is just in general. We know very little about the factors that may moderate the effect of targets on outcomes and the effect of engagement uh, uh, intervention techniques and their ability to engage targets. We need to think more generally as we think about that in the context of sustained behavior change, this is even going to be a more vexing challenge that I think we're going to need to be prepared to grapple with. So finally, what I'd like to suggest is that if we situate our efforts within this sort of mechanistic approach to behavior change, right? So if we think about sort of our efforts to promote sustained behavior change as our ability to promote initial change and then maintain that change and to think about sort of the targets and the strategies that we need to use to affect those outcomes, I think to, to make that be a successful outcome, we need to do, we need to grapple with three key challenges. 
We need to specify distinctions between three classes of targets, initiation targets, maintenance targets, and initiation and maintenance targets. I'd like to suggest we really need to have consensus regarding our outcomes. We need to operationalize behavioral maintenance and success and behavioral maintenance failure. And third, we need to prioritize delineating both why and when our intervention techniques operate. I wanna thank you for uh, listening to this presentation and uh, I look forward to the conversation during the Q&A. Thank you. Well, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rothman um, and our other presenters as well. So now we're going to do some Q&A for a few minutes and we have quite a few good questions. So I hope you, uh, hope you gentlemen are ready to, ready to roll with this. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions for all the panelists just to get us started. And, uh, and then I have some for each of you individually as well. So the first question for all the panelists is sustaining behavior over time is the ultimate goal. It's likely that people will experience inevitable setbacks. I'm curious to hear our panelists discuss the process of re-engagement in behavior after a short or long interruption after making an initial change. So uh, that is, how do you recover? Um, why don't we just go through an order of the presentations, at least for this first one. And Rich, would you like to take that one? Um, sure, I would, because uh, I think this is an important point in our clinical approach in the self-determination theory based interventions that we've done, which is uh, we expect that when people are making difficult changes in their lives, they're going to have setbacks. They're going to have what's called relapses or failures of various sorts. And I think an important orientation we give right from the beginning is that those are opportunities for discovery and learning. So, you know, we can't anticipate every challenge. We can't always know what those obstacles are going to be. And so when we come upon them, you know, rather than classifying that as a failure or a relapse instead, it's like, well, gee, there was something we missed here in our planning and our thinking about this and understanding the vulnerabilities that you were facing. And so now we're back to redesigning in a personalized way how to overcome that. Um, I think in a non-judgmental autonomy supportive way, we try and then re-engage in the process without it, without it being a, a sense of failure or lack of competence. Great, thanks Rich. Uh, Martin? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I endorse uh, Rich's um, thoughts on that. Uh, interestingly, there are uh, techniques that have been identified within various health behavior or theories that have been applied to predict and uh, understand health behavior, um, which and, and within the taxonomies that I talked about and that, that, that Alex talked about, uh, which focus on trying to manage relapse. Um, and uh, the idea is that you would prompt someone, so it would be an intervention strategy, you would prompt someone to come up with plans or strategies that they might engage in, in order to um, anticipate the occurrence of you know future um, issues that might cause people to relapse to help them to identify situations or contexts where they might be tempted to return to the unwanted behavioral pattern and to plan accordingly so what would you do if you are a smoker and you know that the situations where you smoke are you know first thing in the morning uh, when you get up or uh, when you have a coffee, when the cigarette break turns, uh, uh, comes, uh, comes up at work, um, after a meal, those kinds of things, when you're drinking alcohol. So coming up with strategies that you might employ, anticipating those occurrences and coming up with plans to, to enact them. Um, and some smart people who have put forward various theories, for example, Ralph Schwarzer, suggest that uh, we should, we, we call these coping plans. Um, and so these are sort of fairly, fairly tried and tested techniques. Uh, and there is evidence to suggest that they, they are effective. Uh, another thing that occurred to me was also so-called just-in-time interventions, uh, which are um, ways of prompting people uh, using devices uh, to uh, make changes uh, when they are in the proximity of situations where they might lapse. Uh, we have various devices that are available to track people. Uh, that's a little bit big, big brother, but the idea is that people buy into that in order to help manage their behavior to achieve a goal that they're, they're really interested in. Thanks, Martin. Alex, would you like to comment? 
Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just add, take this in a slightly different direction, which is I think one of the, one of the things I, I take from the question is it points to how little we know, I think, about the sort of life cycle of this behavior change process, right? So too much of behavior change is studied almost, is often constrained by the the sort of structural constraints that often emerge around research, right? And so I think the 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 questioner is correct to say that these are things that are going to flow in different ways over the over the life course, and um, we aren't really well positioned to study that flow over the life course. And I think we need to really think about um, how we want to grapple with that challenge. Um, and then I think with that, I would also just ask, sort of building slightly on some of the points I made in my presentation. I think we need to think very carefully about how to understand what's meaningful deviations from, from behavior. And this is, you know, I think, again, I would hold up sort of the science in smoking and smoking cessation as at least a place where people have articulated some principles, whether they are accurate or the best ones we can say. But I do believe that, you know, in the, many of the behavioral domains we work in, it's, un, it's difficult to understand sort of when what, what, what makes something a meaningful deviation from the current behavior, right? So, you know, when is something a slip? When is something a lapse? Um, what does it mean to be someone at a point where you've not done it for so long that you're restarting a behavior or you've not, or, or you are re-engaging a behavior? I mean, I think we all think that those are probably psychologically different tasks. And so, but I don't think we have an evidence base at all to distinguish between them. Great, thanks. I'm very sensitive to what you said there, Alex, in terms of how to study these things. I mean, it seems like one precondition for studying sustained behavior is you have to have studies that go long enough uh, to get into the area of are you sustaining or not sustaining, and that means money and all of the rest. And it strikes me that that's a real challenge that we have, but I'll set that one up. <laughs> I don't know that we'll be able to change that today. I have one more question for all of you, and then I'll have a few for each of you individually. But this was another one that came in from our audience, and it sounded like an interesting one to me. It's something I grapple with a bit in my own thinking on this. Our behavior change theories and techniques are heavily weighted toward rational, deliberative processes. How do we better incorporate other pathways for behavior change? Maybe I'll start with you, Martin, because I know you've talked about some of this in other contexts. Sure. Yeah, and so some of the ways we try to capture these, uh, certainly in predictive studies, is by trying to capture people's beliefs that affect their behavior um, that are beyond their awareness, so implicit attitudes and so on. And researchers have relied on decision-making tasks to try and tap into those, those kinds of beliefs. And there's research that suggests um, that those kinds of attitudes, which are built up over time through positive evaluations repeatedly with given behaviors such that people build up these sort of deep-seated beliefs um, that when the, the context in which the behavior arises um, and, and they, they receive gratification as a result that and is, it happens in conjunction with those positive beliefs, uh, then the behavior is enacted in a very sort of efficient, uh, spontaneous and seldom you know, highly considered or reasoned way. Um, and, you know, researchers have also tried to tap into ways in which we might go about trying to change uh, those kinds of behaviors. And I sort of touched upon those in the final part of my talk, which was trying to break this, this fairly strong bond between the context and the cue uh, and the unwanted behavior. Or if you're trying to establish a habit of a wanted behavior or a desirable behavior, target behavior, um, trying to establish a routine such that those cues become reliably associated uh, with performing the behavior. And so strategies to kind of break those cues would be to try and get people to be aware uh, of the situations where those, 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 those cues that trigger the behavior uh, become present and try to come up with a plan or a strategy um, to perform some alternative behavior in, when those cues arise. Um, or to try to restrict uh, the presentation of those, those cues to try to try to avoid them. Um, and actually, there's some very interesting research showing that people who are very good at controlling their behavior actually intuitively come up with strategies to try to avoid getting into those, those problematic situations in the first place. They avoid temptations effectively. 
Great, thanks, Martin. Alex, would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, I'll just maybe just briefly note. I mean, I think um, uh, first of all, the, I, the presentations last week sort of touched on quite a bit. I think sort of Annie Caldwell and colleagues' work on identity sort of I think sits in this space, and Wendy Wood's work on on habit form habits and habit formation sort of I think nicely sit in this space in terms of. Um, trying to think about sort of how do we understand this, as Martin was just talking about, this sort of interplay with these more deliberative thoughts and these more sort of what we often describe as routinized or automatic inferences or maybe less effortful inferences. Um, I think an interesting question in my mind in this space is, is a distinction that I saw, in, it came up in somebody's comment, and I won't, I, I apologize, I don't remember who was in the questions, but the distinction between behavior, where sustaining behavior involves doing something versus sustaining a behavior involves not doing something, right? And I think, um, I, think, I think that is a really interesting point of inquiry around this issue, right? Where I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm somewhat more optimistic about some of these predictors sort of sustaining um, the absence of behavior. Um, uh, rather, I, I, you know, my students and I, I, I struggle when I talk to my students about what actually uh, exercise habit is. I mean, I, I don't know about other people. I don't tend to wake up, Matt. I don't tend to find myself all of a sudden in my shoes running around the lake and sort of wonder, how did I get here? That, that typically doesn't happen. And so, you know, whereas, you know, there are other things that I do that I have more routinized feel. So I think that's an interesting place to sort of maybe probe this question. Great comments. I've, 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 you know, though I wish I would find myself running around the lake and not knowing how I got there, I, I always seem to know that I got there through a lot of drudgery. <laughs> Rich, would you like to comment? I'll just comment briefly on this. I think there's a place for the deliberative process, especially in the initiation phase of treatment, because I think it's really important that people come to an informed idea about what they're engaging in and, and where they might be going with that. And then I, you know, and I'm, I'm just following the two talks today, I think when we get into the maintenance phase, this is where we get into a lot of the kind of habitual and non-conscious processes that can really disrupt somebody's behavior plan. But again, I think if you have kind of an open and receptive uh, practitioner that you're working with, you can explore those things and you can find ways to overcome it. One of the things that's been shown in research within SDT is when people are autonomously motivated for making a change, they're less likely to fall victim to those kind of non-conscious impulses on a daily basis that are against the, uh, I guess, the, the direction of their will. So they're less erratic in those moments. And so that's why making that decision up front does make a difference. It doesn't, again, explain all the phases of, of change over time. Great, hey, thanks, man. There's so many good questions. I'm, I'm going to, have to pick a few here and uh, apologize for the ones that I won't get to, but there's a lot of good stuff. I'm going to Rich, I'm going to direct this one to you, though. This is a little bit long, but I'll read it anyway, and um, maybe we can follow through with it. Last week, we heard about the importance of identity and behavior, change and adherence. During the Q&A period, would Dr. Ryan please briefly talk about the role of SDT principles in forming scheme identity? We know it's not just about performing the behavior. Something else is required to form these identities. It may be a complex answer, uh, but it is also the act of striving, satisfying needs, and experiencing autonomous forms of motivation for that behavior that help identities and schema develop. Comments, Rick? Uh, well, that, that is a long question. It's got a lot of components to it. Um, I guess the first thing I wanna say is I think identity drives a lot of the behaviors that we're trying to change. So, you know, in many ways we have identities that are built around our drinking or our smoking or our kind of lifestyle habits that we've had for a while. And changing those identities is part of the, uh, I think the, 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 the um, the difficult part of behavior change because you're giving up something that's been need satisfying over time. So I think an important focus for us and in our interventions has been what are the needs that have been satisfied in the behaviors that you're now trying to change so that we can find an alternative place for those to get satisfied. It's not just getting rid of something in your life, but it's trying to add things in that can build a more positive identity in a direction that also can sustain health over time. Um, I think it's a great question. There's, there's six other ways I would go with that, but I don't want to take up all the time on this. Um, I think identity is huge in the process of behavior change and how we internalize that identity makes all the difference in terms of whether we're going to be effectively changing over time. Hey, thanks, Rich. Martin, here's, here's one for you. Re um, regarding the way forward discussed by Dr. Hager, it seems as though the effectiveness of techniques for behavior change 
might be as well assessed from the results of programs which implemented the techniques as compared with a study. Any thoughts on this? And I guess I would add a little question to that. I, you know, I, 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 the, the mechanisms thing for me as kind of a sciencey sort of guy seems great. You know, it's, it's this, like you said, the nice arrows and boxes, and I just love it. And a few years ago or several years ago, when I sort of got started getting into this stuff, I talked to a colleague of mine, and I was all excited about my new toys with the science of behavior change. And he kind of looked at me and said, yeah, I don't know. I mean, how long is it going to take you to get anywhere with that? You're going to start off with a theory and then you're going to get a target. You're going to, just going to show that you engage the target. And then, you know, and he said, you're going to be 10 years before you ever get to a, uh, an outcome study. So I'm kind of mixing up questions a little bit, but maybe address all of that if you could. How long have you got? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, I see we still have people hanging on. So right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no I, these are these are reasonable questions actually, and I think you know field experiments, uh, you know interventions that occur in real world contexts, and moving on from just looking at sort of efficacy trials, um, we can kind of support and look for support uh, within effectiveness trials as well, which is where the you know the intervention is. Uh, provided, um, or we look at that how how well the intervention works and how much they engage these targets um, to people for whom they're provided and they're presented with, not just with a select uh, group of participants. So yeah, I think um, those would be incredibly important. Uh, one of the sort of advantages of having a sort of theoretical basis, and in particular. Uh, looking at mechanisms is that it provides us with a framework as to how an intervention might work, but more importantly, when an intervention doesn't work and the reasons why. In addition to that, it may help us get rid of the detritus, the kinds of strategies and methods and techniques that really aren't doing any work in in determining behavior and changing behavior. And so that, that leads us more towards efficient interventions. And I very much liked Alex's slide which is about the heterogeneity in effects. And that really does talk to this idea that actually heterogeneity, the variability that we observe in certain techniques and certain interventions should diminish as we get closer to finding effects that are very reliable across contexts, behaviors, and situations. Um, and so that's the value of looking at, me- at, at mechanisms and techniques and having a sort of basis, a theoretical basis. Because I, I, my, my hunch is that people... Um, well, it's a sort of systemic problem. People throw the, everything but the kitchen sink at a lot of their interventions because interventions are expensive. And so they want intervention. They want to be able to go back to their funders and to, the, to, the, to, the, to uh, the people that they're working for and say, look, I've got an intervention that works in terms of changing behavior. The trouble is there's a whole mishmash of various strategies and techniques rolled up in that intervention. And we don't really know what's doing the work. And so you, what you have is an intervention that works, but it may be extremely inefficient. And that means costly, right? Especially if it involves a whole bunch of practitioners and so forth. So what we're focusing on is to try and come up with highly efficient interventions. And I think that's the value of looking at, at these mechanisms and so, on, so forth. But I agree, we, we do need to embed them in the context and the situations uh, in which, we, you know, which we're interested in, in changing. Um, and so these more sort of field experiments and interventions are really important. Great, thanks. That's a great answer, Martin. Alex, I'm, I'm going to ask you one, and then I'm going to throw one last real uh, curveball to the group so you can all get ready for that. But uh, really, that just makes you nervous, I guess. Um, Alex, you, you showed us a slide that um, I want to be encouraged about, but I had a hard time uh, because I think I sh- it showed a lot of what we know, which is you know, we had a lot of people trying things out early on. And then by the time we got to the sustained uh, maintenance of behavior, we, we, don't, we don't know much. Uh, the database is kind of limited. It's just kind of the way it is. So given that small database that supports particular techniques for sustained behavior change, how should we go about identifying the likely candidates that we want to focus on moving forward? Well, I actually think, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, well, that's a good question, Kevin, and I'm not sure I know, you know what I mean? I'm not sure I know the answer, uh, but I think 
maybe I'll, I'll go for a, a response that attempts to cultivate some degree of optimism in you and, and maybe the listeners, which is to say, I mean, there actually are a host of, I think, quite um, viable targets that we could be engaging in. I would say that the, the problem I would say is that the sort of broad scientific act enterprise, which we've sort of alluded to a little bit in terms of some of the structural things that are going, and I would include myself here and in, in, as part of part of that enterprise, is um, typically is continuing to sort of mine uh, and, and generate data sort of narrowly. Like we know an enormous amount about what helps people initiate behavior change. And so, um, you know, so, you know, just to be provocative for a moment, if we, we could inceivably say, you know what, we're, we, we actually don't need any more of that in our liter in, in the scientific literature, right? So that we're just going to, you know, for those of you who, you know, we're going to now just shift and sort of think about things that are critically related to, you know, let's just say, you know, maintenance and sustained behavior change or the transition from initiation to maintenance. And so, um, I, I, I think it's actually, we have actually a lot of ideas in the literature that people have talked about today, people talked about last week, I assume some of them will come up this afternoon. I just don't think that we are um, prioritizing the pursuit of answers or, or, or empirical tests of those questions. Um, and so, you know, some of that is structural, as you alluded to earlier, right, in terms of, you know, what the time and financial resources are associated with of studying sustained behavior change. Um, but I, if we really want to know the answer to those questions, then we're going to have to think about creative ways of, of going after that. So my answer somewhat is just, we, we just need, to, we, it's not, we don't need actually new ideas. We just naturally need to do the work to test the ideas we already have. Great. Thanks. And so I'm going to, I, I want to close with just one question, uh, for each of you. If you could, if you could just get a hold of us and shake us up and say, you guys, you got to go do this to get us to sustain behavior. Over time, here here's the one thing. If you don't do anything else, do this one thing. What would it be? I'll start with you, Rich, and then go to Martin, and then go to Alex. Well, I'm going to answer that question a bit by uh, dovetailing off of uh, Alex's answer before. I don't really think you can fully separate the initiation phase and the maintenance phase because sometimes you could find something that powerfully initiates behavior but actually interferes with the maintenance of behavior over time. And I used the example before of powerful rewards that could be get people to start something, but if they're not maintained, neither is the behavior. So how you initiate can bear on how things get maintained over time. So those are separate phases. If I was going to say one thing, and I, I think anybody who knows I work in SUT <laughs> is going to know what I'm going to say in regard to this is we need to support people's autonomy in the process of change. We need to pay attention to their will because that's going to matter over the long term in terms of uh, of a sustainable change over time. I will say I guessed that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> none, nonetheless, still an effective answer. Martin, what would you say? Yeah, I think, I think the one thing, and it's been alluded to in all the talks today, and uh, is, is we need better data on long-term data on the longevity of the effect of our interventions. And, um, you know, we've talked quite, uh, quite, uh, you know, at length about the importance of that and that actually the data is actually fairly limited because of the constraints that we have over, you know, funding, practicalities, those kinds of things in studying behavior change over time and strategies that might work over time. So I think that's where we should, or well, one of the areas where we should focus our, our efforts. And that's what, what I'd like to see. Fabulous. And Alex? Um, well, I'll go two quick answers that are sort of angled in different ways. Um, I, I think sort of in, in it, it may well be uh, a close cousin to, to um, the statement about sort of supporting autonomy is I think we need to be also mindful of to the degree to which people find the behaviors they engage in um, enjoyable and satisfying and that that's and those factors um, and what we need and, and not to say that everything needs to be that but then what do we do if we're talking about behaviors where that just where they are not where that isn't the case and, and how do we have help support people in those situations and then you know I'm sort of prompted by Martin to think sort of I, I would add to what he said and say I think we need to also think about better strategies for studying these things at a larger scale, right? So, so there's a scale in terms of time, but there's also a scale in terms of sort of um, how we do the science, you know, in terms of sort of thinking about 
trials across multiple sites and how do we sort of work more broadly and collectively around some of these problems? I think the, another challenge is that often many of the studies that are in this area are quite good, but they're constrained because they're, they're too small. And so we actually can't get a good, close, precise estimate of what's going on, particularly if also what's happening underneath these, these interventions that work is that there's meaningful meaningful heterogeneity that we can't seem to get our hands on. And I think so. So I think also thinking about how we can work, you know, more collectively around some of these problems would be, uh, would be a great next step. Well, great. Thanks to the three of you for really a very interesting and fun, uh, uh, that was enjoyable, right? So I guess there's intrinsic motivation here, perhaps. Uh, this was a great way to spend a Friday morning. All right, so we're going to take a break for lunch. And we will return, let me see if I have my times here. Yes, we will return at 1250 Mountain Time. So that's, that's a little shorter than we had planned, but hey, it was worth it to get some good answers to Q&A, right? So we'll be back at 1250 Mountain Time. So 1150 on the West, uh, 150 Central and 250 East, if I got that right. You guys can, can do that on your own probably. Thanks so much, you guys. Very nice, well done, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the fourth and final set of presentations for this conference on sustaining behavior change. I'm John Peters. I'm a professor of endocrinology, metabolism, and diabetes at the University of Colorado, Anschutz Health and Wellness Center. We have a great lineup of speakers and presentations in this final session, and we'll hear from Drs. Jason Reese, Jim Salas, and Ken Resnikow. I'm gonna make brief individual introductions before each of their presentations. There are more complete bios posted on the conference website at anschutzwellness.com forward slash SBC. Um, these guys have uh, long pedigrees and they're quite distinguished. So uh, we'll just make the introductions brief and you can see the more comprehensive bios posted on the website. I think these presentations are a great way to conclude this conference as they will highlight some of the practical elements of inspiring and supporting sustainable behavior change from choice architecture, framing and messaging to how we build environments in which we live, work and play to how we can leverage technology to put the theory informed behavior change techniques we've heard about over the previous presentations into practice in both our research and everyday lives. Before we start, I wanna remind everybody to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to put your questions in as you think of them during the presentations. And we will address as many of these as possible during the panel discussion at the end of the talks. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jason Reese. Dr. Reese is the founder, CEO, and chief behavioral scientist of Behavioralize. He founded Behavioralize in 2018 on the premise that behavioral science could be leveraged to drive growth across industries. He saw a gap between what academics were uncovering about how human decision-making worked and how organizations were managing human decision processes. His consulting work has helped Fortune 500 companies, startups and nonprofits develop and test initiatives inspired by behavioral science. He's passionate about behavior change related to health, wellness, and technology. His background has positioned him well to execute on the promise of behavioral science. He did a postdoctoral fellowship with Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman and spent over a decade as a full-time faculty member at Harvard Business, Harvard Business School and the Wharton School. He remains affiliated as a senior fellow at Wharton's Behavior Change for Good Initiative. His PhD is in cognitive psychology and his research has been published in leading health and business journals. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jason Reese and his presentation entitled Lessons from Behavioral Science. Hi, my name is Jason Reese. This talk is called Lessons from Behavioral Science. Um, the angle on behavioral science that I'm coming from is through cognitive psychology, which is what my PhD is in. My research has been about nudging, um, but I'm no longer an academic. I am now a practitioner. Uh, I founded the firm Behavioralize, a behavioral science consultancy. So I now uh, am working with behavioral science uh, from that uh, practitioner perspective. <clears throat> and you may see that. Uh, in the in the high level take that I give give here. 
I'll briefly uh, summarize the questions and, and, and my answers so you can get a sense of where I'm going with this. Why does most behavioral change, most behavior change fail? Overconfident misperceptions and complacent inactions are fundamental human challenges. Um, and I'll describe these a little bit, um, each of them, I say these two broad features of, of human nature uh, are kind of inevitable and we need systematic ways to deal, deal with each, indeed environments that help us deal with each. Second, what needs to happen for behavior change to be sustained, um, we need environments that use what has been learned about nudging and choice architecture. Um, and we do know quite a bit about what those environments ought to look like. Um, but still lots of progress needs to be made. What key studies are needed to progress? Well, studies of choice architects themselves and information architects. Uh, how can they implement and iterate best practices? How can they preserve freedom uh, for users while reducing overconfident misperception and complacent in action? So that's, that's the roadmap, that's the take I'll have. Um, and let me start here by describing what I mean by overconfident misperceptions. Um, this is building on the idea that we think we know more than we really do. As Daniel Kahneman puts it, we can be blind to the obvious and we are also blind to our blindness. As Adam Grant says, once we hear the story and accept it as true, we rarely bother to question it. Visual illusions are a nice demonstration of this idea. These horizontal lines look slanted or curved and that is a series of tricks from the visual system. Uh, shading, spacing in the figure create that visual illusion. What good information architecture would do would be to help us frame reality accurately, give us reference points and guidelines so that we can, we can really see reality. So that'll be a, a metaphor um, for what I talk about along the way and overconfident misperceptions. And, and these are fundamental. We are, we are just prone to this tendency as humans to think we know more than we really do and to be overly certain about our beliefs, to see, believe that we're seeing the world, uh, what, the, what we're really seeing is reality. The second fundamental challenge, complacent inactions. There's a lot of stuff that we don't do that we know we should. Um, here's a representation of the idea of famous Escher image, um, I've added this little good idea over here and these figures just walk right past that good idea because they are doing what they have done in the past. They have their hoods over their heads and they're following the next person. They're going through the motions. Um, and this is how we live a lot of our lives and it's natural enough. It makes us efficient, but it allows us to walk right past good ideas that we might even know are there. As Richard Thaler says, if you want people to do something, make it easy. As Katie Milkman says, in general, we want to do what we know is good for us, just not right now. So we may feel that change is appropriate and lots of good things that we could be doing and we'll do them later. And those are the fundamentals of human nature from the kind of from the, the nudging perspective. Um, let me show a bit more detail about what this looks like. I'll put some names on some of the biases that cognitive psychologists and others talk about. And I'll give some glimpses into the kinds of things that seem to help, starting with these overconfident misperceptions problems. Knowledge illusion uh, is an example. We tend to assume that we understand familiar things better than we really do. This image is from a famous study done. Um, people were asked, how does a bicycle work? And these are people who knew how to ride a bicycle. They've been riding bicycles since they were little kids. Some of them were even expert cyclists. But you ask them how a bicycle works to draw the mechanism. They can't do it. In this particular image, a person drew no gears. The gears are not connected to a chain. The chain not connected to the pedals. No mechanism for propulsion. Um, but the bicycle's familiar, so we think we know how it works. Um, in domains where behavior change really matters, um, this can be a real problem because we eat, we think we understand food and we think we understand eating. Everybody has intuitions about what, what works and what's effective and what matters. Um, and very often wrong. Um, because we hear people talking about things like metabolism, we tend to think that we understand metabolism. Um, but of course, very few people really understand the, you know, the thousands of processes that are involved in, in, in metabolism. But the fact that it's familiar, the fact that celebrities like Dr. Oz talk about it, 
get people to believe that things like metabolism boosters are real products that they can actually uh, actually buy um, and that they have more control over their metabolism than they than they really do. So here's a case where knowledge illusion, I think, looms quite large um, in the food space. Vague verbiage is another um, human tendency in terms of how we look at the world and how we think. This is a great figure created a couple of years ago. Study was done um, around perceptions of probabilities. So people were asked about a variety of different probabilistic words ranging from almost certainly down to chances are slight. And they were asked to assign actual probabilities to those probabilities um, you know, when you hear that term or when you when you use it. And the good news is that the terms that are associated with higher probabilities do in fact have higher probabilities assigned to them. But look how big some of these ranges are. For the word probable, people can put anything ranging from 50% to 100%. Um, very large variance around some of these. So we use our language quite loosely and that can lead us to get uh, to develop facts and mental models of the world that are really quite vague. We might think we're right when we say probably something will happen, but we never differentiated whether we meant probably like 90% or probably 50%. We tend to overstate our abilities to critically think. Here's a study that uh, I, I did with Deloitte a couple of years ago. We asked people, how often do you make critical thinking errors? And we define critical thinking as the objective analysis of facts to form a judgment. You ask any cognitive psychologist that, you know, how often do you make critical thinking errors? Well, <laughs> multiple times a day, um, you know, even the best of us would say we commit critical thinking errors. Um, but you ask the public and 89% of respondents understate the frequency of critical thinking errors, at least by my definition of not, not noting uh, or conceding that they do it every day. So we think we're better thinkers than, there, than we are. Uh, we're overconfident, nearly universal tendency to be too certain in our beliefs. Here's an example of how that was demonstrated. This is a study that we did uh, last year in the context of travel health vaccines. We asked people a series of general knowledge questions like this, what's the approximate percentage of people who get infected with malaria per year in Kenya? Now. I think the correct answer is 5%, uh, but I don't actually know the correct answer. When I did the study, I knew the correct answer, but um, it's okay to not know the right answer. But the idea with confidence is that you should have some idea of how correct or incorrect you are, how likely you are to be right. And that's where people tend to really fail. So we asked a series of questions like this, general knowledge about travel medicine and travel medicine vaccines. And then we ask people, how many of those 10 questions do you think you got correct? And here's what we find. And this is a very common finding versions of this. Uh, the original paradigm goes back to the 1970s. The actual percentage that people got correct was around 50%. So 48% they got right out of, out of 10. Um, how many they thought they got right out of 10? They thought they got 65% uh, right on average. So they know they're not perfect, but they are much more imperfect than they realize. And this is a fundamental human tendency. And this is one big aspect of what psychologists talk about when they say that people are overconfident or overly certain. And it's a problem because, um, you know, from a point of intervening or developing lasting behavior change, we might think, well, they only got, we focus on what they got wrong. They got about half of them right. We can raise this blue bar by educating people. Well, what about that yellow bar? What about educating them on, on how, how much they don't know um, or helping them become calibrated? That's a, that's a much more difficult problem um, because you know, the more facts they get, the more, the more confident they might become. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So how do we solve this problem of overconfident misperceptions? Well, it's a variety of different kinds of nudges and approaches that can help move people along to realize places where they might not know quite as much as they think they do. Um, motivational interviewing from the clinical world is a common approach at the heart of motivational interviewing is asking good questions. 
Um, at the heart of good negotiation is asking good questions. Uh, Adam Grant writes about one of his studies in his recent book, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. He has a study showing that skilled educators ask many more questions than average negotiators. That's part of what the skill is, asking good questions so that the person you're talking to um, partly at least realizes what they don't know or gets them thinking more carefully about what they what they really care about and ought to care about. In terms of knowledge illusion, how can you get people to realize they don't know quite as much as they think they do or that familiar objects or familiar processes like metabolism may not be quite as well understood as they think? Well, you get them to explain it. When they explain it, they do realize that they don't quite know everything that they thought they did. So creating contexts where people can explain the ways in which they actually, uh, what they think can help shed light on what they don't, shed light to them what they don't understand. Um, you really know whether you know what you're talking about when you can make good predictions, um, but most of us don't tend to make predictions in normal situations. You don't make formal predictions by saying, this and this thing will happen by this and this date with this and this likelihood. That's one of the hallmarks of, of good forecasting, but most of us don't do it. So this is another one of the kinds of interventions coming out of the cognitive psychology world. Uh, this is research from, uh, from, Phil, from Phil Tetlock. Getting people to make predictions and think explicitly about things is one way to get, uh, help them shed light on what it is that they don't really know. Okay, second major source of behavior change failure, complacent inaction, why we don't do things that we know we should, and how can change be sustained? Some of the famous uh, cognitive and motivational biases, status quo bias, the tendency to want to keep things as they are, uh, continue doing what we've always been, been doing, present bias, uh, I like this cartoon, sorry I'm too busy for anything important right now, um, putting out fires from all these little little emails. We tend to focus on what's in front of us right here and now, and not not be as forward thinking as we as as we might be. Um, and many of the problems where we're looking for behavior change are exactly those where we're trying to get us out of our immediate beha uh, um, present behaviors uh, and get us thinking to outcomes, health outcomes, savings outcomes that will be further down the road by by acting today. Okay, so what do we do about biases like status quo bias? For decades, behavioral scientists have been talking about the power of defaults. This is a famous paper, summary results from a famous paper nearly a decade ago by Johnson and Goldstein, showing that in culturally similar countries within Europe, where you have to opt into organ donation, participation is much lower only about 15% of the population, whereas in countries where the default is to be an organ donor and you have to opt out uh, if you don't want to participate, around 98% of the population uh, does actually uh, give consent and participate. So you overcome status quo bias by creating a better status quo. Even the perception of defaults can be powerful. Here's a study led by Katie Milkman, who directs the Behavior Change for Good Initiative at Wharton, where they run very large studies. They call them mega studies. Here's an example. Um, different groups of researchers developed different nudges. They nudged around 800,000 people through text messages, trying to get them to get a flu vaccine. Um, they tried around 20 different nudges all developed by different groups, researchers around the world, and they compare them in a head-to-head -to, -head to see which ones worked best. The three best nudges were all some variation of saying that a flu vaccine was reserved for the person receiving the message. So there could be many mechanisms or elements at, at, in play for these in terms of what made them successful, but a major one is probably the perception of a default. The assumption in these messages is that, is that you would want to get a flu vaccine, so you're not being converted in an important way. You'd want one, um, but now the system is set up for you to get it. Defaults are like the poster child for behavioral science. How can we get defaults better set up in more of our environments? Here's another uh, example 
um, this is a study that I was involved with with uh, with Katie Milkman and uh, and her then student Heng Chen Dai who's now faculty at UCLA. Um, we find that people are more motivated uh, at different times called the fresh start effect. Everybody knows that people are more motivated for things like weight loss and exercise and diet change um, around around Christmas time. But we showed there are other times as well, first of the week, first of the month, first day after uh, national holidays, first day after people's birthdays, they're just a little bit more motivated So how, uh, to, to, to do aspirational type things like this. So how, how could a good choice environment take advantage of that effect and get people kind of restarting on a regular basis in line with what fits their natural motivation cycles? Here's another neat study from this space led by um, Hal Hirschfeld at, at UCLA. Um, this is done the savings consequences of uh, financial savings, retirement savings. They invite young people, undergraduates uh, in their typical studies, but they've done field studies as well um, to imagine what they might look like in the future. And they don't just invite them to imagine it, they show them these renderings of what they will look like in the future. This is actually a picture of, of Hal uh, the, the lead researcher, um, a digitized picture of him and then digitized to what he will look like when he's at retirement age. And it's still how he can still see himself in that image. And to young people that can be quite motivating, realize that 30, 40 years from now, they will still be themselves. And when they implemented this as an intervention ahead of asking people how much money they would save for retirement, people were more likely to put away money for retirement when they could see a future self, especially a happy future self. So bringing the future closer to the present in key moments of decision is another good feature of, uh, of a good choice environment. So th there are no shortage of effective nudges out there that can move people in the, in the right direction of being realistic about their beliefs and about making good, smart choices for the future. Um, and of course, we need more studies like that. Um, but what, what I am hoping to see in the coming decades is research within large systems, within health networks, within social media platforms, where um, best practices in nudging are put together to create um, good information architecture, good choice architecture to make it easy for people to believe the right thing and do the right thing. I'll give you some examples of the kind of work that's being done uh, in this direction. Here's just a restatement of, um, of what I'm hoping to see. Studies of the actual char choice architects and information architects. How can they implement and, best, and, and iterate best practices. We've got some ideas of what these best practices are, but how can, how can we study implementation? How can they preserve freedom for people while, while still reducing opportunities for overconfident misperception and complacent inaction? That's where I think the big research question uh, ought to be. Uh, the Nudge Unit at the University of Pennsylvania is a pioneer in this approach. Penn Medicine has a Nudge Unit dedicated to improving choice processes within the hospital system, trying to set up places where good defaults can be made, defaults by, by the healthcare practitioners themselves, by the physicians um, and nurses themselves to, to, to nudge patients towards, um, toward, towards best possible behaviors, like adherence and such. So I'm gonna just mention a couple of studies from that from that group, focusing more on the concept than the, than the, the detailed results. Um, but this is a paper, Scott Halpern was a senior author. Um, clinicians could use choice architecture more effectively in patient management than they actually do. And I'll just read the, read the blurb here. Uh, clinicians assume the role of choice architect, whether they realize it or not. Our results suggest the majority of physicians have inadequate choice architecture competency. The uninformed use of choice architecture by clinicians may influence patients and family members in ways clinicians may not anticipate nor intend. So they asked about a variety of uh, techniques to nudge patients towards more, um, you know, more uh, health appropriate behaviors, 
or more downstream types of, of, of behaviors. Um, and, you know, in some cases, physicians had intuitions about what would work well. In other cases, they didn't. But it was clear that they were not optimally utilizing what's known um, in the study of nudging and choice architecture optimally. So opportunity for people who are, in fact, in choice architecture roles to do better choice architecture um, and better nudging. That's one of the big opportunities. These are some, some early studies on what the challenge is. Um, and what some of the opportunities are. Here's another study from that group, the role of behavioral economics in improving cardiovascular health behaviors and outcomes, implementing a series of nudges among clinicians and among patients within one healthcare ecosystem, systematizing those, automating them so that they're actually being used at, at scale, not just in individual, in individual cases. So I think that's one big part of the story. Um, finding places within institutions where the choice architects themselves can be can be supported. The other set of institutions where I think this is important is within social media platforms where of course misinformation is all over the place and it's particularly pernicious because misinformation or some evidence that it spreads uh, more quickly and more deeply than true information partly because it's often surprising um, and, and often emotional. So there are many groups, um, you know, working with the social media platforms and critiquing them, telling them how they might be able to implement better information architecture practices to help people avoid some of the most problematic overconfident misperceptions that, that have become so prevalent. I'll give just uh, one example of that. This is featuring the work of David Rand. Um, and his colleagues uh, at MIT. Um, our information consumption habits are not oriented towards truth seeking or trade off resolution. Um, so there can be sort of an implicit assumption that, that social media is just about sharing information and people are going to do the, the truth seeking and good thinking themselves. Well, uh, if you think about it, most people browse Twitter and Facebook to unwind. Hardly the mindset you want to adopt when engaging in cognitively demanding tasks. People aren't exactly after the truth, um, but they do know the truth when they see it. And this is, I thought was an interesting study um, by by Rand and others. So uh, here's here's what they find first. So just note: people are in the habit of sharing both true and fake news. So they show people a bunch of headlines and they say, "Would you share this headline?" And the answer was yes for around half of the true headlines and just about half of the fake headlines. People were saying, yes, I would, I would share it. You'd hope for a very large discrepancy here between would you share uh, for the true and fake. And that's, that's not what they found. They found that there was uh, pretty similar levels of yes to what would, what would you share. Um, but this is before people had really thought about whether they were, were true or fake. But you ask them to think about whether the headline is true, true or fake, and they, they can kind of tell. It's much better discrimination here. For the ones that are true, it's like 80%, 90%, they say, yeah, that's true. For the ones that are fake, they're pretty good. Um, you know, yes, they get fooled sometimes, but by and large, they're saying those fake headlines, yeah, no, that's, that's not true. Um, but that's not what the sharing pattern looks like. It's just so intriguing about this. Um, the truth-based sharing is not the habit that people have. Um, social media context focuses attention on factors other than accuracy, the amount of positive social feedback that people receive. So as a result, users get distracted from even considering accuracy when deciding whether or not to share. Uh, those are some quotes uh, from David Rand in, in describing this work. I think one way to put the question, you know, people currently ask, should I share this? Uh, they ask that before asking, is this even true? Uh, could platforms help people get more in the habit of reversing the order of those questions? First asking, is this true? And then asking, should I share? Um, and that's the kind of research that I think we need more of. What are ways that platforms can get, um, can support better information architecture, support better information sharing habits um, so that people are less prone to overconfident misperceptions? So ecosystems with thoughtful information architecture and then ecosystems with thoughtful choice architecture as explored by things like nudge units to prevent complacent inaction. That's uh, where I hope uh, much of the research action will be in the coming years. And I suspect that we'll be hearing 
more about these kinds of approaches throughout the session of this conference. Thank you very much. Wow, a lot to think about. Um, before we move on, I wanna nudge people to make sure they uh, put their questions in the Q&A. So we have lots of discussion uh, during the panel uh, coming up after the third, excuse me, the third talk. So our next um, speaker is Dr. Jim Salas. Um, he is a distinguished professor emeritus in the Herbert Bernheim School of Public Health at the University of California, San Diego, and a professional fellow at Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. He was trained in psychology and behavioral epidemiology. His health improvement programs have been studied and used in healthcare settings, schools, universities, and companies. His current research interests are promoting physical activity and understanding policy and environmental influences on physical activity, nutrition, and obesity. This research has been conducted across all age groups in the US and in two age groups internationally. Dr. Salas is a prolific author. He's authored over 750 scientific publications and is one of the world's most cited authors. He's currently focusing on getting research um, applied to creating healthier, healthier cities. Dr. Salas is past president of the Society of Behavioral Medicine, member of the US Academy, National Academy of Medicine, and he's won numerous national and international awards. Dr. Salas's presentation is entitled, The Role of the Built Environment in Behavior Change, Physical Activity Examples. Hello everyone, this is Jim Salas, and I'm happy to be talking to you today. And let me get my slides ready here. And what I'm going to talk to you about today, I call the environment and policy imperative in behavior change. So I'm really talking about what uh, are some promising strategies to create lasting behavior change? So let me continue here. Uh, here's my outline. Uh, first, health behaviors have multiple levels of influences uh, that we don't always pay attention to or operate on. Uh, ecological models uh, have the potential for uh, guiding us towards um, environment and policy changes uh, to support long-term behavior changes. I'm gonna give you just the tip of the iceberg of evidence supporting health-promoting environments. And I'm really gonna be focusing almost completely on physical activity uh, because that's the area that I know best and we have uh, uh, many good examples there, but uh, the principles apply, I think, uh, to um, most health behaviors. And I'll end with a few uh, ideas about uh, next steps for research and practice. So if we look at the big picture of what's being done to improve physical activity. Um, this is uh, less true now than it was before, but it still applies. And I think we make minor investments in programs. Those programs are generally guided by theories that emphasize psychological and social influences. The primary goals are education and behavior change skills training, targeting individuals or uh, small groups. And um, they're supported uh, not very well um, uh, because the organization of physical activity interventions is fragmented, poorly coordinated, and poorly funded. So if we look at the overall what I call psychosocial models of health behavior, they're, they generally look like this. Um, well, the models show that uh, behavior is influenced by biology, by psychological factors like attitudes, uh, and by behavior change skills. And the, the social and cultural environment plays a role. And But the social environment is usually examined in a um, a narrow way like your family or your coworkers or your friends. Um, will these individually oriented interventions ever be sufficient? 
And I argue that they won't be. Um, uh, they can be effective, though. We have plenty of studies showing that they can be effective, primarily in the short term, which uh, creates problems uh, when we're talking about long-term change. But I think they'll never be sufficient because programs, the reach is always limited. The effects are generally modest and maintenance is rare. And so that is not a recipe for uh, long-term solutions. And maybe perhaps most important, the individualized programs are not designed to change the root causes of current behavioral patterns. So I wanna give you just an example of some uh, root causes. But first, um, uh, let's expand our model a little bit. The individual, the social and cultural factors are still important, but um, uh, their reach is limited, as I mentioned, and their permanence is limited. So, but if we change the physical environment um, and we change the policies, then you reach virtually everybody within that environment or um, in the jurisdiction affected by that policy. And with some limitations, those physical um, environment changes and policies are relatively permanent. And so what, is, what does that look like? So think about if, we, if everybody had access to healthy food environments like this, you went into a food store, whether it was large or small, and you just had all of these colorful, healthy options. Well, that would be great, but I don't think that describes America. Uh, what we have in America are food environments um, that are designed to undermine healthy choices. And uh, the Heart Attack Cafe is a, is a good example. Uh, come in and get your heart attack with deep fried butter and chocolate covered bacon, things that we are programmed to enjoy um, and love in some cases. So really plays to our biologically determined and our psychological weaknesses. So, um, uh, so we see this, but uh, more frequently we see things like this, including uh, I would call misinformation, defining healthy breakfast as bacon, plus sausage and eggs, but cooked in olive oil. I guess that's the healthy part. And uh, then we see uh, um, this uh, restaurant or buffeteria Tubby's, and, uh, and that's an odd name for a, uh, a restaurant, in my opinion, that is clearly promoting unhealthy foods. And then here's something that uh, amazed me by being short-lived. It was on TV for a little while, the Glutton Bowl, the world's greatest eating competition. And uh, you would think in America that would be a big seller, but uh, strangely, it didn't last long. Okay, now if we turn to physical activity, our environments and policies have changed so profoundly worldwide. Work used to mean actually moving and doing things, um, but now most work is uh, computerized or uh, automated or mechanized. Um, and, and so that has changed physical activity patterns, again, profoundly. Another example is we have worked very hard to change our environment to make walking unnecessary and unsafe. And of course, walking is central to the whole history of humankind. Um, but look at how much we have changed the environment uh, to, uh, uh, to make that um, more, much more difficult. And um, so uh, how did that happen? I'm going to stick with the transportation theme for a bit um, and, uh, and, and take some lessons. So um, this is uh, a graph of funding for federal funding for pedestrian and bicycling. And you will, you will see that this graph starts at 1992 because before 1990, um, uh, federal funding uh, was banned uh, from being used for pedestrian and bicycle uh, programs. So, um, and if you, if you look over to the right um, at, the, at, the, at the peak, um, uh, there in 2009, with some of our economic stimulus, um, pedestrian and bicycling funding achieved 2% of, of federal uh, transportation funding. And you see that's double what it was uh, in prior years, 1%. All right, so um, 
that that in in fact is a is a policy intervention to promote driving um, and to not promote walking and biking. Well, uh, let's see uh, the if that uh, intervention has produced stable behaviors. And uh, oh, one um, uh, one other one other uh, thing here. I love to show these actual U.S. postage stamps uh, because they show how we've designed our communities to make walking and biking difficult by uh, placing where the places where people live, these subdivisions, far away from where they want to go. And that would include shopping and jobs and schools. And we, um, we've also made active transport uh, impossible on our uh, transportation infrastructure, like um, the, this interstate highway, where uh, not only would it be incredibly unsafe to walk or bike, but it's prohibited by law. And think of the trillions of dollars that we have uh, put into creating this um, inactive uh, environment. So let's see, has this intervention been effective? Well, that blue bar that you see is the percent of uh, people, of adults, commuting to work by driving, by private vehicle. And I would say that's, that's a sustained behavior change since 1969 um, uh, with a, a little bit of up and down, but still uh, uh, near 90 um, percent. And the, uh, the walking and other, other would mainly be bicycling, has also been pretty stable. Uh, I don't think they, they probably uh, measured walking in 1969, so that's why it's zero. Um, but you can see over time since 1977, it's trended downward from very low to excruciatingly low. So there's an example of interventions that have been effective in, uh, uh, in uh, creating sustained patterns of um, transportation, all, although uh, completely in the unhealthy direction. All right, um, uh, here's another example with children where these interventions have been even more effective because you can see that uh, the, the light blue line is, uh, uh, is cars going to school by cars. And that has gone up from 20% to about 60%. Um, and the darkest uh, blue line walking and biking has gone down dramatically from 40% to just above 10%. So um, in, the, in the realm of transportation interventions, uh, this has been effective at getting people to, to uh, use cars even more. Um, but again, from a health point of view, um, it's, it's been a bit of a disaster. Okay, now let's, let's get into some evidence. But, and so I wanna, I wanna focus on the design of cities. And uh, after 20 years of, of researching this, my conclusion has been cities can be designed to move people or to move cars. But I have yet to see a city that's uh, uh, successful in, in doing both because the, uh, the needs of people, um, certainly walking and biking, are pretty much opposite of uh, cars. So if we look at the two, uh, the two photos, the top photo on the left is, of course, Manhattan, uh, which is America's most walkable uh, community. Uh, the photo on the right um, uh, would surprise you because this is a, what I saw uh, when I had an opportunity to fly into Cape Town, South Africa. So if we think unhealthy designs of communities is limited to North America, um, we would be wrong. Um, so it's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. So I'm going to talk about, so I'm going to uh, show you data about um, the relation of walkability to, um, uh, to physical activity and transportation behavior. So what makes a place walkable? One, a mix of uses. So you know Manhattan is, uh, um, you're, everybody there is within walking distance of just about everything you could think of within just a few minutes. Um, and you can see on the right, um, well, you can't really see, but it's, this is virtually 100% uh, uh, residential uses. So uh, there may be a few stores in there. I, I can't really tell, but this is uh, 
a se separation of uses on the right. Um, and uh, uh, another thing we look for in walkability is connected street grids and the grid of streets and avenues in Manhattan is famous um, and iconic because you can get, you have direct routes just about everywhere you want to go. On the right, you don't have direct routes because if you wanna go from one side of either of these main highways to the other, um, those are not connected at all. You've got to go all across this, this one bridge. Um, and I, I don't know how you, you cross the, uh, the, the, the vertical uh, street. So um, very bad for uh, pedestrians. And then higher density. Um, and, and a lot of communities in the US, density is a four letter word. Um, we don't want more neighbors. We don't want more traffic. Um, but density is necessary because it allows mixed use um, so that the places where you want to go can be close enough uh, to you um, and, and that there's enough population to support local shopping and local schools and that sort of thing. And the, the, other, uh, the other thing that I'm not going to focus on too much here is we need to design streetscapes for safe walking and biking. And of course, in the, in the US, we tend to do the opposite of that. So that there are uh, uh, streetscapes in the US are uh, by policy designed for moving as many cars as fast as possible. And of course, uh, speed is a uh, speed of cars is um, a, a risk factor for uh, people who are walking and biking. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data, starting out with our neighborhood quality of life study uh, that we did. We started 20 years ago with a, an interdisciplinary team um, and uh, we designed the study to examine, well, what's the impact or what's the relation of walkability to uh, physical activity? So we had to make sure that we had variation in walkability. So we selected communities or neighborhoods that were low and high. And we also selected neighborhoods within the, the walkability strata that were low and high in socioeconomic status. That then uh, assured us that we were not confounding um, income and walkability, but it also allowed us to examine the equity, uh, the, uh, whether walkability had uh, equitable effects in high and low SES. So we did this study with adults, uh, basically age 20 to 65 in the, the, the Baltimore region and the Seattle, Washington region. So we have a little diversity. So uh, I'm gonna first show you reported um, walking for transport minutes per day. And um, the green bars are high walkable. And you can see that there's much more walking for transportation in the high, uh, people who live in the high walkable neighborhoods. It's two to five times as high um, as in the, in the low walkable. So, uh, and, and noticeable effects in both um, low income and high income. All right, so now uh, let's look at, Total physical activity. Now, this in uh, this is measured by accelerometers. So we have minute by minute readout of how, uh, how active people are, and this can be activity in their neighborhood, at work, in a park. It can be anywhere. Um, but we're looking at how is that related to their overall neighborhood, and we do see more total physical activity in high walkable neighborhoods. And the, the difference uh, by walkability, it doesn't seem that high, um, uh, five minutes to seven minutes per day. You know, you said, are we gonna, you might wonder if we're gonna uh, really change our, the way we build our neighborhoods based on that. And, uh, but it, it's, more than, it's more important than you might imagine. So um, if, we, if we look at seven minutes a day, that's approximately, or even less than, uh, uh, well, that, that would be more than 50 minutes per week, but let's just say 50 minutes per week. That's about two miles per week of extra walking uh, if you lived in a walkable neighborhood. If you walked very, very, very slow, that would uh, uh, equate to about 100 miles per year. And roughly speaking, uh, that would be an additional 10,000 calories per year. And roughly speaking, that would equate to about three pounds less weight gain uh, 
uh, other things being equal among people who lived in high walkable neighborhoods compared to low walkable. And we do see um, uh, the expected differences in obesity rates uh, across high and low walkable neighborhoods. I'll just show one more result from this study and it's driving. Um, and uh, you can see that there's much more driving in the low walkable neighborhoods. And, and, and the, the results are similar uh, to, to, by education. Um, and that's 100, uh, about 100 minutes per week um, uh, additional driving if you live in a low walkable neighborhood, because in fact, most low walkable neighborhoods create dependence on automobiles because they, they don't have enough density to uh, support good transit service. And uh, of course, by definition, you can't walk too much. So, uh, so anyway, uh, think about the relevance of this for climate change. All right, let me just, a little bit more evidence here. This is another one of our studies um, in adolescence. This is called the teen study. We also have studies in uh, younger children and in older adults, but I'm just gonna give you a, a sample here. So this is accelerometer-based uh, total physical activity um, uh, with the, uh, the same breakdown by income and walkability. Um, and uh, you can see we have basically the same results. Now, the overall amount of physical activity is much higher in uh, adolescence, which we uh, have come to expect. But the difference is very similar, about seven minutes per day, um, as we saw in adults. And, and we see this over and over. And, this, and the same applies to older adults. The, the results are a little bit different for, uh, for the, the younger children. Just one more thing. Um, active transportation or the ability to walk to school is, um, is, is generally better in the high walkable neighborhoods. So we see more walking to school. Um, and, and so um, these are not uh, prospective data, um, but, we, but the intervention is permanent. The intervention of the design of the neighborhood is permanent. And, and, and the, uh, well, we looked at, do these uh, results vary much by the time that these adults or adolescents live in the neighborhood? And it doesn't really matter that much. So, so there's maybe some reason to believe that these are um, uh, relatively stable or at least uh, uh, somewhat permanent um, uh, effects on behavior. So let's, uh, let's move on. So, uh, there's now a, a lot of, uh, you know, hundreds of studies showing the relation between built environments and physical activity, so much so that the uh, CDC's Community Preventive Services Task Force adopted this recommendation based on evidence. And this was based on prospective um, evidence or, um, or natural experiments that, that actually changed the um, uh, change the environment. So the recommendation is that built environment approaches combining transportation system interventions, places to walk and bike, with land use and environmental design, uh, what I've just been showing you, walkability, is an effective intervention for physical activity. And I give you a little a preview um, that there's going to be a similar um, uh, recommendation coming out soon about uh, changes in parks and, uh, and green spaces and, and recreational facilities, also based on uh, prospective or intervention uh, uh, data. Okay, um, now uh, let's, let's take a look here. Research is not easy to put into practice. Um, and so this is illustrated by um, if uh, studies come out um, that you know, sidewalks are really important to help people walk, it is not the case that the next day the cement truck comes out and pours sidewalks. It doesn't work that way. And on the right, um, it's even when uh, cities try to do the right thing and put more sidewalks in, well, it doesn't necessarily always work out correctly. And I, I wanted to show this picture because I took it in the Denver area. So, uh, you know, Denver is trying to do good things for pedestrians, but it, it's hard. And so that's why 
uh, my first research need is more a dissemination and implementation research. We need to figure out how to um, get our research uh, into the hands of decision makers within cities and states so that they can use it to change policies. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a whole uh, set of research in itself that we need, need more of. Uh, we also need research on the equity of opportunities for physical activity. There are complex patterns of disparities in physical activity. There are also complex patterns of disparities in physical activity environments that I, I don't have time to go into. But we need to uh, address important questions like, what are the roles of historically discriminatory policies like redlining that have made uh, uh, um, uh, communities of color and low income communities um, generally less safer and uh, for, for walking and biking and uh, less well served by recreation facilities like parks. What environment and policy changes could produce more equitable opportunities for physical activity? Um, people are certainly working on that. How can we improve underserved communities for walking and biking without stimulating displacement? And I would say this is a, an urgent um, question that we don't have good evidence about right now. There are practices that people are doing and trying that need to be evaluated. So this is really important. And uh, one, one final issue about equity is how can we uh, use research to improve physical activity opportunities on tribal lands? Uh, uh, this has not been addressed much that I know of. So there's another, another opportunity. And my last intervention uh, recommendation is to focus more on multi-level interventions. And so this is, the, um, this is the, the promise and the lesson of ecological models that, um, that if interventions um, uh, work on changing influences at all levels, they have a better chance of being effective. So uh, many interventions conducted in practice are multi-level and these should be evaluated. There are great opportunities for practitioners and researchers to work together to generate practice-based evidence. And uh, due to the nature of environment and policy changes, investigators and researchers cannot randomly assign them to individuals or communities. So appropriate designs are needed, such as evaluations of natural experiments. And these can be really powerful and we need more of them. Um, so multi-level interventions for physical activity are particularly challenging because of the need to uh, collaborate with multiple disciplines and sectors like uh, transportation uh, engineers, um, city planners, parks and recreation uh, 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 professionals, geographers, and uh, economists. The, the list goes on and on. And so I, I want to end with one uh, example of a... Uh, a multi-level intervention that has some evidence of effectiveness. And it's the, uh, an evaluation of safe routes to school, which um, at one point was a, a specific line item in the federal transportation budgets. And, and these, um, so states could apply for grants and then uh, uh, implement them. And the, this is a, one of the evaluations. And they uh, safe routes to school programs are multi-level because of these uh, of transportation um, uh, model of how how you do effective transportation interventions. It includes engineering, which is changing the built environment. It includes education with, and uh, encouragement, which are obviously focused on individuals and families. Enforcement is a policy uh, intervention. That, um, that focuses on the broader community and then uh, 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 the evaluation. So, uh, so it is multi-level um, uh, multi in nature. Um, so let's look at what they found. Uh, so they uh, evaluated hundreds of projects in five states, pre and post the implementation of the intervention. And you can see that um, a pre, pre and post, there, were, uh, there was no controls. 
Um, but pre and post, there was uh, an increase in the percent of kids walking from 10% to 14%. So that doesn't sound, that's not getting 80% uh, of kids to walk, but it's a 40% improvement. And we would expect that to, uh, to last as long as the inner, inner interventions lasted. And you can see that there wasn't much bicycling before or after the interventions here. So uh, this is an, uh, but it, it's an example that interventions are occurring, that multi-level interventions are feasible and can be done. Um, and so uh, this is a way to both use the evidence to stimulate more interventions like this and to um, uh, and to create more evidence by evaluating them. So thank you for paying attention uh, to my talk. And if we were there in person, I would ask you to stand up and I would probably lead you in a few minutes of uh, activity. So maybe we can do that later. So uh, thank you uh, so much. And uh, I am going to end the presentation there. So um, uh, let's have a, a great discussion now. Well, thanks, Jim, um, for that great talk. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break, um, give people time uh, to get up and move around a little bit. Um, it's uh, 151 here in Denver now. So we'll take a 10 minute break and reconvene at uh, 201, uh, 101 Pacific Time, uh, 301 um, Federal Time, and 401 Eastern Time. So 10 minute break. We'll see you in a little bit. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you got a chance to get up and move around a little bit, get the blood moving. Um, I'd now like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Dr. Ken Resnikow. Dr. Resnikow is the Erwin Rosenstock Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He's also Professor of Pediatrics in the School of Medicine. He's Associate Director for the Community Engagement and Health Disparities Research at the University of Michigan Rogel Cancer Center, and he's the chief scientific lead at the university's Center for Health Communications Research. His work over the past 30 years has focused on designing and evaluating behavior change programs for a wide range of health behaviors, including, and this is a long list, smoking cessation, breast cancer treatment, genetic testing, COVID-19 vaccination, cancer screening, car safety, weight control, diet and physical activity, effective parenting, medical adherence, organ donation, substance use, youth violence and risk behaviors, gun safety, and accrual into clinical trials. Wow. Much of his work, both his interpersonal and electronic interventions is based on motivational interviewing and is influenced by chaos theory and self-determination theory. His recent work is focused on designing and implementing health coaching and e-health programs, ranging from behavioral and mental health to preventing and management of chronic disease. Dr. Resnikow is particularly noted for his work involving ethnic, racial, and underserved populations, particularly African-Americans, Native Alaskans, Latina, Hispanic, and Middle Eastern North Africans. He's published over 340 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and has been PI or co-investigator on over 80 NIH grants and other externally funded grants. Dr. Resnikow's presentation today is entitled Tailoring of Behavioral Messages, eHealth. My name is Ken Resnikow, and I'm a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan and the Robo Cancer Center. Today, I'd like to give you my take on the core question for this conference. Why do behavior change attempts often fail? And what can we do about it? When I was asked to participate in this conference, it reminded me that we have been asking some of the same questions for almost 30 years. Interesting, while many of the same reasons for why behavioral effects decay are still active, as I'll discuss, advances in both theory and technology provide us with a whole new set of tools that we can bring to bear to address these problems. Let me begin by establishing a few key concepts. These will greatly guide our presentation. First of all, motivation can be thought of as energy. 
how much energy are you willing to devote to initiate this change? And how much energy are you willing to devote to maintain this change? Next, change energy is a finite cherished resource which we defend. This defense of change energy can actually manifest itself as ambivalence or resistance. When we are depleted, when we are exhausted, when we are overwhelmed, perhaps due to stress or other factors such as illness, we can become more resistant to change and our change attempts under these circumstances are less likely to succeed. Now that we've defined motivation as energy, we can begin to describe different types of motivational energy or different qualities of motivational energy. Now, historically, most behavior change interventions have relied on three strategies or the three Fs, fear, facts, and feedback. However, more recent data suggests that these drivers have a relatively short half-life. They're not great sources of motivational energy. As we'll discuss in a few minutes, a stronger and more enduring energy source one that, one that is associated with better outcomes entails linking the behavior to one's roles, goals, and values. Let's continue with our motivation energy metaphor. Successful long-term behavior change can be thought of as a state of energy independence. Well, what do we mean? When we do a behavior without the need for discipline, convincing ourselves, or exerting impulse control, the behavior starts to become energy independent. Now this is the preferred state and is associated with long-term success. Well, let's use the example of substance misuse. During treatment, individuals are generally encouraged to think of themselves as in recovery, not recovered. Now this is in part because as long as it takes energy, as long as it takes impulse control, the person is not yet energy independent and they're at risk for relapse. However, if they reach a state where they're no longer attracted to their drug of choice and they don't inherently have a drive towards that substance, they're approaching energy independence. That is, it doesn't require any energy to resist, any effort. And the same can be said of healthy eating and exercise. When someone begins to intrinsically enjoy physical activity or healthier foods, and it doesn't take psychological effort, effort or convincing, they're approaching energy independence. Habit strength and intrinsic reinforcement drive the behavior rather than willpower or persuasion. Now we'll come back to this shortly. These concepts are informed by self-determination theory. SDT, developed by DC and Ryan over the last 30 years, is an explanatory model to understand initially who thrives at school and in the workplace. But it turns out it also provides tremendous insight to help understand why many behavior change attempts fail and what we can do about it. SDT delineates several classes or subtypes of motivational quality, particularly controlled and autonomous. Controlled motivation entails doing something for external others, such as a doctor or your spouse, or when you're doing something out of shame or guilt or internal pressure. Conversely, autonomous motivation is volitional, it's meaningful, and it's aligned with your roles, goals, and values. SDT also describes another class of motivation called intrinsic motivation. And this is what we were referring to earlier when we talked about energy independence. This entails doing the behavior because it's naturally reinforcing, because it's enjoyable, pleasurable, novel, or challenging. According to SDT, there are three elements of high quality motivation. Volition, it was my decision, meaning it's important to me, an optimal challenge. It's in my skill set to do so, and it's just hard enough that if I do it, I feel I've accomplished something. In general, in motivational interviewing, which is an extension of SDT principles, we don't progress to the how phase of counseling until we have this very strong why informed by key concepts of SDT. A few years back, some colleagues and I developed the difficulty by motivation matrix, which as we will see, further informs our answers to the three core questions of today. The matrix starts on the x-axis, 
which maps behaviors or behavior changes by their degree of difficulty. In other words, how much energy does it take to do the behavior or make the change? On the left is the simplest class of behaviors called brand switching. While on the right, we see the most difficult behavior challenges such as addiction, weight control, and chronic disease management. In the middle, we see moderately difficult behaviors like getting vaccinated or wearing a seatbelt. Even within a domain, for example, physical activity, we could differentiate between adding activity amongst those who are already active and starting activity that is going from zero to one for people who are currently inactive, with the one on the right being more difficult than the one on the left. This is brand switching. Here, the behavior already exists, but the goal is to get you to choose our brand, Coke over Pepsi, our shampoo versus their shampoo. It is relatively rare, however, in behavioral medicine and public health. Our behavior changes are much more complex. Brand switching can be achieved with simple nudges like small coupons, text messages, whereas more complex and difficult behavior change generally require more intensive interventions. Now let's add the y-axis. This captures motivational quality. You can see the self-determination concepts of controlled and autonomous motivation on the upper and lower end. This equates to low quality and high quality motivation. What the model suggests is that if the behavior change is difficult and motivation is low, or even if the behavior change is relatively simple, but resistance is high, then we would suggest a more intensive intervention such as motivational interviewing. Alternatively, if the behavior is simple or it's complex, but motivation is high, then less intensive and perhaps less expensive interventions like incentives and nudge messaging might be tried first. So now let's return to the three core questions of this conference. So why does most behavior change fail? Well, to answer this question, I divided the reasons into three domains, the individual, the intervention, and society. Let's begin with the person factors. First, one reason interventions often fail is that motivation fades. It moves from the foreground to the background. While someone might be gung-ho in the first few days of a behavior change attempt, that drive can wane, leaving the person more susceptible to their impulses. Number two, energy wanes in part because individuals initiate change from the weak motivational pathway. For example, as we discussed earlier under self-determination theory, that would include the controlled and extrinsic motivational pathways. Another challenge is that for many behaviors, there are persistent, often intense urges pulling the individual towards the risk behavior. For example, substance misuse and diet. For many of these behaviors, even a small slip can derail the person. And this can be exacerbated when operating from an all or nothing perspective, which can lead to abstinence violation syndrome. As we'll come back to later, preparing people for handling lapses is an important, often underemphasized aspect of behavioral treatment. Now let's talk about aspects of interventions that may be contributing to our failure rates. Using the conceptual models we presented earlier, we can view relapse or intervention failure as a lack of energy independence. Thus, our interventions may need greater emphasis on building habit strength and inducing intrinsic motivation. Second, our interventions often ask participants to jump to how too soon. That is, individuals are encouraged prematurely to start their behavior change journey before they've solidified high quality motivation, which as we mentioned earlier, entails three elements, volition meaning an optimal challenge. And finally, many interventions simply provide insufficient dose and as we discussed earlier, fail to adequately prepare the individual for lapse. While my talk is focused on largely individual and intervention factors, of course, macro or societal factors also are at play. And although it won't be the focus of the remainder of my talk, it's important to at least acknowledge that availability of 
substances and poor quality food, the lack of prevention infrastructure, and the fact that prevention services remain understaffed and underpaid, particularly in under-resourced communities, also all contribute to the failure rates of our behavioral interventions. So what can we do about it? What needs to happen for behavior change attempts to be better sustained? Well, I want to offer three related suggestions that we'll go into in a little bit of detail. First is the use of ecologic momentary assessment and geolocation. Both of these can provide just-in-time assessments and lead to the delivery of just-in-time messages delivered right when the behavior is happening or about to happen. Let's take a look at a few geofencing interventions that our lab has developed. Our first geofencing intervention was done in collaboration with a colleague at the School of Pharmacy. The goal was to lower sodium intake amongst individuals with hypertension. We first marked, geocoded, where these folks shopped, where they ate, and where they worked. Then when they got near one of their stores, the app woke up and asked them what they were shopping for. In this case, the person was shopping for mustard. Well, then the app would recommend various lower sodium options compared to the one that they were interested in. Similarly, when they were eating at a restaurant, in this case, Chipotle, the app would wake up and ask them what they were thinking about eating. Depending what item they said they were interested in purchasing, the app would offer a rating of the sodium content of that item. And then the app would give them some feedback after they made their decision. Here we use geofencing to address substance use and firearm behaviors. The user marks locations in their environment where they either carried their gun previously or have had a physical altercation. Then, when the individual comes near that location, a tailored message such as this would pop up. Again, you can feel the just-in-time nature of what geocoding allows us to do. And finally, let's take a look at the Health Kick Obesity Prevention Intervention developed by Dr. Wolford and our team. Here, both the mom and the adolescent are given versions of the app. In this case, the app is asking whether or not mom is there to buy food for her daughter. She is, so the app recommends some foods that are healthier options to buy for her daughter, at this case, McDonald's. And it also encourages mom to help her daughter, Keisha, achieve her goals of trying to eat healthier next time she eats at a restaurant. Similarly, the app for the teen gives advice of what would be a healthier option. It then asks the user to rate whether or not they achieve their goal. These goals were established in a previous encounter with the app. Then it asks the teen to set a goal for the upcoming week. It then communicates that goal back to the mom who was asked to support her daughter in achieving that goal. Now let's look at another innovation that has tremendous potential to improve the effectiveness of digital interventions. And that is something that we call behavioral inference. This involves detecting the status of someone's behavior or even their emotional state without having to ask them through a survey. You're already familiar with some natural behavioral inference that's going on with your devices. So for example, you're probably aware that your phone is detecting or has the ability to detect your physical activity level and to give you feedback on that. And many of you, while you're driving, have a sensor in your car that using data about your lane changing and other behaviors um, infers that you might be either intoxicated or sleepy. 
but I'd like to share with you three novel examples of behavioral infants that I think have particular promise for behavioral interventions. In this study, the investigators asked whether or not they could estimate drinking behavior by naturally occurring smartphone interaction paradata. And they did so by looking at 30 young adults who had a previous history of heavy drinking. What they found is simply by quantifying how often someone unlocked their phone, they could classify them into one of three categories, not drinking, moderate drinking, and heavy drinking. And what they found is people tend to check their smartphones less as their drinking increases. This is screen unlocks per minute. They also found that during moderate drinking episodes, phone interactions are briefer, yet during heavy drinking episodes, phone interactions are longer. And this is interaction seconds. What they also showed is during heavy drinking episodes, typing speed slows down and typing errors increase. Just using these paradata, they were able, with 97% accuracy, able to classify people's drinking behavior. Here, devices were used to help quantify smoking behavior. Two wearable sensors were provided, one that measured breathing pattern and one that measured wrist movements on a six axis accelerometer. Here's what the wrist sensors look like. What they were able to show is during smoking, the hand comes to the mouth and is immediately followed by a deep inhalation. And those breathing and hand patterns are very different than, for example, walking and eating. Here, you could see the respiration and accelerometer patterns of those three behaviors, smoking, walking, and eating. Of the 32 relapsers, this device was able to detect 28 smoking relapse episodes, and just using the wrist device, 24 of 32 episodes. Mobile sensors can also be used to predict depressive symptoms. In this case, 28 adults carried a mobile phone with a specific sensor data acquisition for two weeks. They looked at a few outcomes, how much time they spent in the home and how much distance they walked in the community. They also looked at phone usage frequency and phone use duration. What they found is these variables were associated significantly with PHQ-9 scores or depressive symptoms. And to summarize, here's what they found. People with greater depressive symptoms visited fewer locations. People with greater depressive symptoms spent more time at home and they move less through space. Let's discuss one other way that we can improve the impact of our digital interventions. And that is through the use of natural language processing. In collaboration with our computer science and engineering program, we've developed several NLP based agents that will eventually be used to deliver counseling interventions. One of the first tasks was training the agent to recognize high and low empathy counseling encounters. We did so by feeding into the agent 276 motivational interviewing counseling sessions, each rated by the degree of empathy expressed by the counselor in these encounters. And just by looking at the number of words per exchange, we we're able to pretty accurately distinguish between low empathy encounters and high empathy encounters. Counselors in low empathy encounters speak more. And counselors in high empathy encounters are better able to match the linguistic vocabulary and style of their patient. Using both content and style components of the encounter, the agent was able to distinguish between high and low empathy encounters with about 80% accuracy. We also coded every exchange by whether or not there was a reflective statement on the part of the counselor or an open-ended question. Here's an example of a question, a simple reflective statement, and a complex reflective statement. And then using various natural language processing software algorithms, 
We ask the agent to learn to predict what is a reflection and what is a question. And although these data are somewhat complicated, the gist of it is that the agent was able with about 80% accuracy, able to distinguish between reflective responses and other types of counselor responses. Now, in theory, these data could be used to give counselors feedback for example, here's feedback that we could give them about how many reflections they used in the last session and the last couple of weeks and months, or how empathetic they've been in the last session and the last couple of weeks and months. And we could then provide them with additional support and training opportunities, particularly to boost areas where they may be underperforming or their skills may have drifted. Our team, led by Siki Shen, has begun development of an agent that can actually generate accurate reflections based upon spontaneous client statements. In effect, the agent does two things. It looks into a database of previously coded reflective statements and then tries to contextualize what the patient is talking about. And then it tries to pull the best matching reflection, but changes the content to match what the client was talking about. So in this case, the patient says, I had a really hard time sticking to my diet. The agent finds the closest previous exchange where a client said something similar and pulls a reflection that was used and coded as appropriate. Then it tries to use synonym matching to contextualize what the patient said. And then it generates a new reflection combining the reflection pulled from the library and the contextualization input to generate a reasonable response. Then they asked raters to blindly rate the AI generated reflections compared to what was actually used by clinicians. And in general, in the pink bars, when reflections use both of those techniques, pulling the matched reflection from the library of reflection and contextualizing it based upon synonyms it found for what the client was talking about, the relevance, reflection, quality, and overall quality of the conversation was pretty similar in the AI version, that's pink, compared to the ground truth, which is blue. Finally, one last thing about improving the effectiveness of interventions. I think we can use more creative designs to help find out what works for whom. And two examples are smart trials and reinforcement learning trials. I'm just gonna spend a minute on reinforcement learning trials. Reinforcement learning trials allow an intervention to be adapted in real time for each user so that users will get different content, different modality, for example, digital versus human, a different sequence. One may get message A first, then message B, another group may get B before A, and it can impact the dose of the intervention. Now you decide short term which of these things to vary, usually based upon a short term function. So if we're looking at a smoking cessation app, the short-term function that it might decide on could be intention to quit smoking or barriers to quitting smoking. And the function can also be based on just reducing cost, not necessarily even increasing efficacy. And finally, just a few other ways that I think we can improve the efficacy of behavior change interventions. I think we should continue to explore deeper personalization. So tailoring not just on knowledge, attitude, beliefs, and barriers, but deeper tailoring on personality traits, such as your needs for autonomy and your tendency for reactance. And finally, we showed you some wonderful ways that behavioral inference can be used to help measure behavioral status and emotional status, and then guide the delivery of just-in-time interventions. But there are many other behaviors for which this might be possible. So for example, we might be able to use naturally occurring sensor data or camera data to estimate dietary intake, medication adherence, maybe with hand movements, and finally things like violence prevention, we might be able to detect that someone's um, in an angry state. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Resnikow. Um, I would like to ask the rest of the speakers, Jason um, and Jim, to rejoin.
uh, live so we can have a panel discussion. Hello, Dr. Salas. Hello. And uh, I don't hear Jason. Are Jason, are you uh, on? I am. Yes. Sorry, it took me a moment to unmute. That's okay. And if Dr. Resnikow is still. I am here, but it won't show my video, but I'm here. Okay. That's all right. Um, you can do your jumping jacks now. So thank you all for uh, great presentations. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience. And then there's some $64 million questions that uh, I think apply to this conference um, that I'll ask at the end. So first question is sort of a combination question that actually came in for Dr. Resnikow, but Dr. Resnikow had had a question earlier that was for Jason, but they both kind of followed the same theme. So the audience question was, in climate advocacy, there's an idea that if we can get people to make small changes, they will often take further and larger actions. Does that align with the research? And I think, uh, Dr. Resnikow, you had a question uh, actually for Jason mm -hmm. during the presentation that was talking about when you apply some of the behavioral science um, learnings that he put out in his presentation to certain behaviors like smoking cessation and weight management and so forth, um, you don't necessarily see that, uh, that outcome. In fact, making a, you know, if you have set up a more unrealistic weight loss goal, at least one study shows that you get a better effect. Um, so how, how applicable are some of those, you know, um, behavioral economics principles to some of these health behaviors or are there exceptions to the rule? I'm happy to go first to give Jason a chance to digest. Thank you. Um, in terms of the gradual change, now there's a really interesting app called Tiny Habits um, out of a fellow from Stanford who I am, because of my old age, cannot remember his name. Um, and BJ he Fogg. is our, huh? I think it's BJ Fogg. Yes, BJ Fogg. And he's argued that tiny steps um, are the way to go gradual, build your efficacy, build your habit strength. There's an interesting quirk in the data that I think people should be aware of. And there's a phenomena called sudden change and it's called various things. But we know from a fair bit of studies, including one we did, that people who quit smoking out of the blue, they do not taper, they do not prepare for two, four weeks, actually have better outcomes than gradual changers. That same phenomena has been observed for alcohol and for OCD, depression, and anxiety treatment. That is people who have this epiphany, this what some people call catastrophic shift, um, this epiphany actually do better than people who do it gradually. It probably is the case that there's different types of personality that do better with gradual planning. For example, we found African-Americans in a study did better with gradual planning for smoking cessation, whereas Hispanics and white folks did better with sudden change. So there's probably cultural and individual differences, but we should at least be aware that gradual small change may work. And there's definitely people for whom it is the desired pathway, but there is this whole other pathway that um, is surprisingly efficacious in the studies where it's been examined. I have two, two builds on that. Uh, if I may, Ken's gonna be much closer to the research than I am, but I have two, two uh, let's call them hypotheses. One is that in behavior change cases where, where craving is a particularly strong element and cravings come back, it's actually very hard to create small steps that really are small steps. So the, the sudden change may have a particular efficacy in those cases. That's a hypothesis, Ken, if you have data to speak, if, if that jibes with the data that you're seeing, uh, be great to hear it. If not, so be it. Um, so, so that's sort of like on the, on the negative side, the craving. On the positive side, I could see with, um, and again, this is a hypothesis, I could see that with sudden changes, um, like streak-based success, where you're counting the days and then the streak builds and you wanna keep that streak. I think it could be more potent um, that, that streak psychology in cases where it has been a sudden stop. So that's another, that's another thing keeping you going. So in other words, there'd be, there'd be two aspects that would, that would support this hypothesis. One is that when, you, when, you, when it's a hard stop, the craving diminishes sort of like quite sharply 
um, it's still there, but it, like it really do get a, a good drop off from that. And you get this uh, sort of increased pull to keep going from, from the ongoing streak. That's hypothesis because it has two mechanisms. Maybe we can call it a theory, but there it is. Ken, any further thoughts on that? No, I think that might explain um, uh, uh, the smoking data. I don't know if it explains the mental health data, but we also um, find that when people make a very dramatic change, their efficacy goes very high. We always call it the dieters high, that if they could eat this very weird regimen that they normally wouldn't, um, and they have a dramatic weight loss, there's this little, you know, like the runner's high, there's this sense of, of a boost in efficacy and a boost in elation or almost mood that is accompanied when people make a big change. So I think we have to factor that in as well. Jim Salas, do you have any comments on this as you think about yeah. activity? And well, um, I, I'm going to approach it from a different point of view. The, the, the premise of this was about climate change related behavior. Um, and um, uh, I want to alert people to uh, something that I'm involved in, uh, as are quite a few other people. And the uh, Society of Behavioral Medicine has a, a project going now um, based on input from its members that climate change was their number one priority. And so there's a, a series of presidential working groups uh, focusing on different aspects of uh, of climate change, including individual behavior change and communication and health equity and that sort of thing. I'm on the, the policy and advocacy uh, work group. And our starting place on, on this was um, behavior changes are needed on it by individuals to uh, reduce their carbon emissions, but that's never going to be sufficient to, um, uh, to avoid catastrophe. So uh, what we're doing is saying the, 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 the best thing that individuals can do uh, to help with the climate change problem is to put pressure on their uh, elected officials and leaders to change policies. Um, and we, we're promoting the idea of behavioral scientists taking on this issue uh, and, uh, and basically developing educational and behavior change programs with the target being advocating for policy change. Um, so, um, you know, I think a lot of the uh, principles that we've, we've heard from Jason and Ken could be applied to that as a behavior. And so there's going to be a series of papers coming out in translational behavioral medicine sometime sometime next year. So I, I just wanted to put a, a different spin on that question. Well, that's actually something that I wanted to raise to the panel, which is thinking about the cross product between these big health behavior changes that we're uh, targeting and advocating and climate change, both from the standpoint of they both seem like really ginormous um, and difficult problems. And at the same time, they're interactive because climate change is going to change the way we live, one way or the other, and um, and so that that's that's also a factor. So to put a question to it, I mean, we heard from previous presentations about um, when you're going to intervene with somebody, it's not only uh, beneficial to intervene with the individual you're trying to change the behavior of, but also the practitioner who's trying to change that behavior. And so when I think about that and, and apply it to the question you just raised, Jim, uh, how do we take behavior science and apply it to changing the behavior of our policymakers? Um, so it's, it's not only about changing the advocacy of the people whose constituency uh, we're talking about, it's about uh, sort of setting up the policymaker uh, to best respond or to, or to really react to that so that they change their behavior, at least short of making um, making them lifetime appointees. <laughs> um, that's a that's a, a a difficult one of getting them to maybe uh, change their own transportation behavior, their own dietary behavior. Uh, let's say to to be more uh, climate uh, friendly. Um, that 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 would be tricky. Um, you know, I think that that's something that might have to be done by 
uh, people within their network. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know if I have any great ideas about that, but, uh, but uh, elected officials are uh, usually very sensitive to external pressure from their constituents, their voters. And, um, you know, the idea is to, uh, is to get more people to be advocating for uh, a wide range of, of climate friendly policies, many of which would also be improving health, like getting people to walk more, eating less beef, um, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, so that's going to get the elected officials' attention, and then they might be more uh, sensitive to uh, changing their own behavior or um, listening to other people in their network that would uh, who would push them in that direction. Any thoughts from uh, from you, Ken, about that uh, that problem? Maybe some uh, really effective EMA. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting sort of behavioral challenge because they are driven by an external reward. So their entire motivational system, although they may initially campaign, as they say in poetry, but they govern in prose, they may initially talk about values, but ultimately um, the prime directive is to get reelected. So I think that's why their values and other things can shift. So I think in that world, it's much more of operant conditioning than, than meaning it is the the reinforcement of getting reelected, I think, and, and fundraising that drives a lot of their behavior. It would be very interesting if we could center politicians on their purpose and values and actually um, have them function from that part of their brain. Um, that would be a wonderful uh, change to how the system currently functions. Jason? Another perspective that I think is in the spirit of your question, John, is, you know, perhaps advocacy for and, and you know tools and forums to support evidence-based policy making where policies are made with realistic behavioral assumptions um, you know as, as described by behavioral scientists do behavioral scientists have a stance on you know what are the limitations of nudge type approaches Ken and I were just speaking about that a little bit um, and I've seen some of this, in um, discussions of vaccine hesitancy in cases where incentive, incentives have been tried to get people uh, to, to vaccinate. Um, and the behavioral scientists involved in those approaches are saying that there was never a claim that it would get everybody to do this. And there may be a point when uh, maybe a, a sort of a, a range where incentives will work and then a range um, of hesitancy uh, where, they, where they simply won't. And uh, getting policymakers to be to be realistic and nuanced about that, um, I think, is a possible area for effort, but not an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is it, it's very interesting to me that we're we're at this point where we have all of these techniques um, aimed at the individual, and then uh, Jim Salas pointed out everything we need at the larger level, which is kind of the, uh, the fixed environment in which we lived. Um, how, do we, how do we sort of build the political will to, to make that change happen? And we have this big problem with hyperbolic discounting uh, where I was intrigued by Jason's presentation where it was sort of the, the ghost of Christmas future. Um, you can see what you're gonna be like when you're retiring um, and that might help incentivize you to prepare now. You know, not everybody lives in a place that's gonna be underwater in a hundred years. How do we get people to appreciate what, what is coming and use that as some of the motivation to, um, uh, to make a change? Or is that, is that just not feasible? We have to start somewhere else. And we apply this to health behavior. I know we're talking about climate change, but it's the same, it's the same thing in a sense. Well, one way to think about it is it may be very difficult to change politicians' behavior, but we can focus on the voter. And for the voter, a lot of the things we've been talking about, a combination of nudges and sort of, for some people, you have to do one-on-one -on -one MI. You have to go to their home. Stacey Abrams' team knows that and try and link voting to their values. So I do think 
um, if we think about the behavior change on the um, electorate, then almost I think all of the things we've talked about are apropos and trying to build that um, autonomous motivation and get away from that inertia for people who haven't been voting, which is that zero to one step, which is so difficult. Um, that's, a, I think, a, a domain where these principles apply tremendously. Yeah, and for things like climate change, where you're trying to get individuals to to bring their future closer to them so that they can see it and experience it, um, there certainly is opportunity there with voters. Jim? Um, one, one of the things that uh, we've been working on for a while and others and Abby King in particular is this idea of, as I mentioned, of training citizens to be advocacy. And we've been focusing on um, uh, identifying problems that they would like to have solved in their neighborhoods. And it could be healthy food availability or safe places to walk or um, uh, uh, parks that aren't safe, that sort of thing. And, um, and, and people love this because it's empowering for them. Um, and they, uh, they identify problems in their neighborhood. So it's highly relevant and present. Um, and they make a, a re recommendations and a pitch to uh, some type of official who has the ability to make a change. And they often see that change. So I see this as a starting point for a bringing more civic engagement um, that you could then leverage to, um, uh, to uh, uh, extend to voting, to extend to making further requests of their elected officials and maybe going from the local level to the state and, and national. And um, so I see the, uh, the potential for scaling up of something like this, like if uh, if similar programs were in every school or offered by um, civic organizations or churches as a way to start out maybe something very local, but then build civic engagement, which is clearly gone off the tracks uh, in this country, certainly during the pandemic. I really like that idea. Is part of what uh, what your group is doing is sort of building the toolkit for communities to say, here's how we start. Let's start with something we care about, even if it has nothing to do on the surface with climate change or physical activity, you know, if it's, um, if it's garbage or whatever it might be, let's start somewhere and, and build the, uh, the momentum to be, uh, be engaged as a community. Hmm. So um, I'll ask a question that Jim Hill asked at the very beginning of the conference, uh, last week, which is, what do each of you feel is, uh, is there any optimism here? Are you optimistic about anything or is this just, uh, you know, we're at the bottom of the mountain pushing the boulder and uh, the mountain keeps getting taller? Who wants to go first? Jason, you were first on the menu. <laughs> Can you narrow the question a bit? Optimistic about what exactly, John? Optimistic that behavior change techniques are going to improve, optimistic that behavior generally and the outcomes associated with it will improve, optimistic that policymakers will adopt a more evidence-based approach. Well, you can pick what you want to be after. <laughs> I have a feeling you would say um, that. Um, yeah, I mean... Sustaining behavior change and where we are today and where we want to I, go. Um, I think most of our listeners are interested in kind of the health behavior aspect of things, but we've now brought climate change into the picture. So whatever yeah. you want to comment on. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that the individual management tools for people through their gadgets are going to get better and easier to use. I mean, just the sheer amount of time people are spending on their, on their gadgets has to provide some opportunity for that. I get it that it can possibly make things worse, but but I do think there's opportunity to make it better. I think on the social media side, there is opportunity for, um, you know, su successful um, groups to develop uh, that can provide the kind of um, motivation and coaching and just sort of uh, culture of of behavior change and personal management. Um, 
to to help things help things improve on the on the uh, on the health front. I am optimistic that um, some of the problems of misinformation can be solved through um, through better management of the social media platforms. That isn't inevitable, but that I that I am somewhat optimistic that will happen now that we've understand understood what some of the real uh, real threats of misinformation are, um, which you know misinformation has been around for a long time, but their their opportunity to uh, accelerate through social media, I think, has only you know, really only recently been measured. Um, so I'm I'm optimistic. Great, thank you, Ken. What about you? I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. People often make a joke. Well, if I was Oprah and I had a personal chef, I would be thin. If I was Serena Williams and I had a motivational life coach with me 24 hours a day, I would be uh, you know, productive and all that. The technologies that I shared with you are moving in that direction. So though, of course, we're a few years away, but if things continue to grow and we get more creative, people will have this individual coach with them 24 seven and the better we're at it, the more it's going to a mimic the good things about human interaction and then add things that a machine does better um, about not judging and not <laughs> using guilt and things like that. Um, and I think we will be able to do that and account for um, disparities and, and improve or reduce some of those discrepancies by race and income. So I do think technology and I'll leave society and structural to Jim because um, I am optimistic about that, but I, it's not my area of expertise. But I really do think the individual level, we can do a lot with some of the techniques I mentioned and our devices and new ones that are coming down the pike. Is the geofencing technology that you applied, is that anything that's uh, either commercially available or, or on the rails? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And you can buy a data set now with every coordinate of every fast food restaurant in the world. You could find, I think most physical activity places have been mapped and you can download them. So a lot of the stuff is, it is this that people are at, you know, trying to charge for things that used to be free, but you can get a lot of these great data sets and the geocoding software, um, the major two platforms um, make it relatively easy to use. Although occasionally we get frustrated with some of their gatekeeping. Yeah, and we don't have to rely on consumers to pick them up on their own. I mean, you're developing them presumably for use within health systems, uh, at least in part. And once the health systems master them and adopt them, um, then it becomes a you know an extension of the of the physician and the other providers. Um, and there's a uh, the, 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 there's then a gatekeeper and a natural ambassador, and they just become part of life. Um, just <laughs> you know, let's give us a couple decades. Yeah, uh, you, you, you can't be in behavior change and not be optimistic. You, uh, so that, that's just a given uh, <laughs> that we think behavior can change. And, um, and, uh, and on, the, on the policy uh, issue and environmental change, um, the, the things that we, we uh, started working on 20 years ago uh, and were completely foreign to uh, a lot of people uh, to the extent that when we first, uh, our first paper on walkability in a health journal, um, we had to uh, put a glossary in there because people said, this sounds interesting, but we have no idea what you're talking about. But now um, uh, the walk score is on every, um, the website of every realtor pretty much in America. And people use walkability information to choose where they want to live. And in fact, there's plenty of data. People want to live in walkable neighborhoods and support zoning changes to, to make them legal to build. So, so there's, there's um, you know, these things are happening. And um, I, I, I'm very optimistic uh, that one of the things that um, we have going on in California, we changed our uh, criteria um, or way of judging transportation projects. The, the uh, transportation uh, used to have the goal in California, and it does still does in the rest of the country, of moving as many cars as fast as possible, you know, relieving congestion by moving cars faster and building more roads. Well, now in California, the, the goal is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. So it's the opposite goal. So that is now a policy that's going to be driving billions of dollars every year 
in, in transportation funding. So there are good things happening in creating healthier environments. They're just not happening everywhere. So I'm less optimistic, certainly on the climate change front, that we're to make enough change in time uh, to, to avoid uh, really uh, further disasters more than we have now. So, um, so that's, that's the way I look at it. Well, that was really, um, really great. Maybe someday we'll actually have a, a healthy environmental impact assessment uh, that gets done before any new project uh, passes muster. So, well, I wanna thank the panelists for, um, for all of their insights. Uh, I know we went a little bit off the rails relative to bringing climate change into the fore, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the climate we're working in, in a, in a sense. So um, these are all interrelated uh, uh, behavior questions. And uh, you guys did a great job of helping us think through some of those. So what I'd like to do now is to uh, turn the mic back over to um, Dr. Dan Bessesen uh, from the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center. He's the executive director who will try to uh, pull all of this together uh, in, a, in a summary for everyone who's, um, who's still on the line. Dan? Yeah, I want to thank our last speakers there. That was really terrific. And the, in fact, the whole conference, I think, has been really uh, mind expanding for me. Um, uh, and again, uh, I, what it highlights for me is, is the number of really smart people who are doing great work in this area uh, and, and really moving forward a number of lines of research. Um, uh, and, and for those of us who have a particular area of focus and interest, uh, I hope uh, I certainly learned a lot of things from areas that I don't think about all the time. Uh, and uh, so I appreciate that each area has evolved and has become quite rigorous. Uh, and while sometimes the technology uh, and level of thinking is outside the scope of some of our expertise, I think I personally learned something from each of the talks that were pre presented. Uh, I think one other thing we learned is, is that there really is a difference between initiating behavior change and sustaining behavior change. And, and one of the challenges is that sustaining behavior change may be hard to define. Uh, exactly what do we mean by that? Uh, what is a lapse and what is a relapse? Uh, and, and in addition to being difficult to define, it's even harder to study because it takes such a long time to really uh, understand it. But I think the enthusiasm that we've had for participating in this conference emphasizes how important the topic is. And I think there's a lot of great work that's happening in this area. I think we learned that context is really important, especially when we talk about long-term behavior change. Uh, and context has been defined in many different ways from the person's local environment uh, to, to the larger environment. Uh, but I think the conference has really emphasized the need for us to consider context in all the studies that we do. And ultimately, I think this idea of, of dissemination and implementation, how do we take rigorous research studies and translate them into really meaningful changes in the society? Um, and there is a tension, I think, between rigorous research uh, and pragmatic research. Rigorous research is, is needed and it is happening to really better define uh, both at a cellular level, what's happening in terms of the neurophysiologic systems that uh, help guide behavior, and also in the behavioral science that we heard about earlier today, a really rigorous approach to mechanism uh, and to linking a behavioral intervention with changes in behavior. Uh, so uh, that rigorous science is, is important and necessary. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a need for uh, pragmatic research to take what, what's learned from the basic sciences and, and to move it into actual practice so that people actually benefit for, from the things that are being learned. And I think we heard from Russ Glasgow that that area, dissemination and impl implementation research, is a discipline of its own that is evolving and becoming more sophisticated. So I think it's important uh, for all of us to just be uh, somewhat conversant in the developments in disseminate, dissemination and implementation methodology and thinking. Um, I won't go on here because uh, I think there's a lot of great content that we've heard from the conference. I do want to uh, have some thanks uh, to Christy Truesdale, who's really provided the uh, support for our speakers and for organizing this conference uh, today. I also want to thank Catherine Schmidt, who is the marketing uh, person here at the Antutes Health and Wellness Center, for her help in uh, uh, our website 
uh, her and her team in developing our website and helping to market this, uh, this conference. Uh, I also wanna thank the folks in the Office of Information Technology here at Colorado who helped put on the conference. Uh, and of course, the Colorado and Alabama Nutrition Obesity Research Centers uh, for their support of this. I want a couple of apologies. Uh, uh, we be, uh, I'm aware that we, our speaking panel did not have the kind of uh, diversity that I uh, uh, think would have been more appropriate. Uh, I think we were, uh, uh, did made a, not an error. Our speakers are great and uh, we're really excited that they were willing to participate. If we were to do this uh, in the future, we would make a greater effort to have the panel uh, reflect the diversity of the research community. Uh, so I apologize about that. Uh, I also want to apologize about some of the uh, technical issues with the lack of clarity in some of the slides. I know that, uh, that uh, in the video feed that was frustrating for some of our attendees. So I apologize for that. But in response to that, our goal is to make these presentations available to you in a way uh, that's useful uh, for those of you who've attended. There was so much to digest here. And I know I'll be going back and looking at some of these presentations again. Uh, so we're going to post the presentations uh, on the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center website. We'll post them individually and also uh, as uh, sessions for your review in the future. Uh, when we do that, we'll send you an email. It'll be in just the coming days uh, so that you'll have access to those uh, presentations. We'll work with our presenters to uh, post their PowerPoints. If we can, we did ask them this up front. Uh, and so uh, I can't promise that they'll be willing to do that, but I know some of the slides were difficult to read. And so perhaps that will help you uh, to find the reference or see the data that you perhaps were unable to uh, during the video presentation. So we'll be working on those and communicating with you about that. The other thing that will come up here in the next couple of days is a survey. Uh, this is the first time we did a conference like this. We were excited by uh, the topic. I, uh, it was wonderful for me personally. We had 550 people sign up for this conference, which to me reflects uh, some level of interest in the community. Uh, our survey uh, would just be curious about um, what you thought about the uh, topic and the format. Uh, do you think it would be worth doing this again sometime in the future, one, two, or three years from now? Uh, would this be something that's best done virtually or in person when time uh, allows us to do it in person? Uh, and uh, so, uh, and you can give us any other feedback that you have about topics um, and uh, things that you uh, would like to see if you think it would be useful to do this again in the future. Um, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to participate in this and uh, for our speakers who are still on again, uh, gosh, every one of you did such a terrific job. I'll be going back to your talks and I've already learned things from them that I will be using in my own clinical practice and considering in my own research. Uh, so thank you again uh, from here in Colorado. Uh, uh, this is the end of our first Sustaining Behavior Change Conference and perhaps we'll see you again in the future. Take care.